Yeah. Oh yeah. He just he has he said he had him stage in the okay. In the room. I set. Okay. okay. All right. This is the September 9th meeting, uh, 2021, of the Fire Station Building Committee. Um, Jenna tonight is generally interviewing two architecture firms. Uh, I think it's Doran Whittier and Schwartz Silver tonight. Um, so first agenda item. We'll open up the floor to public comment. No one from the public is here. Certainly no one on online since. I think my even Clive couldn't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> That's me on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hearing no public comment, we'll move to agenda item two. Please conduct interviews for a designer for the fire station project. So, as I mentioned, uh, first up tonight we have Doran Whittier, and then second will be Schwartz Silver. Um, hopefully, everyone got a couple iterations of the questions that we're going to ask tonight. Um, first, uh, I know what was handed out had 18 questions. And I think that is because um, the six questions submitted by Aaron and Chris got added to the end. They did. Um, um, apologies on that. No, that's fine. So I think in general, I was my suggestion was trying to get this down to nine or ten questions. Uh, I think that might be doable in 40 minutes. Um, Oh, I didn't take a roll call. Shoot. You don't because you're in the room together. Oh, okay. So we don't have to mark you don't Justin have to. as. I mean, I'll, I'll note that he's not, <laughs> he, that he's absent in the, in the minutes, but um, because you're together, you don't actually have to take a roll call. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Um, so we had pared it down um, kind of in some back and forth internally. We had pared it down to, to 12, uh, maybe trying to get two or three more questions either combined or if we didn't think they were necessary crossed off um, I guess first off Aaron and Chris I went through your questions it looked like a, a few of them were kind of already covered by questions that we already had yeah definitely 18 which is, was one of mine is already covered in you know, other wording somewhere else it's kind of just a general question yep Okay. Sorry, we, can, we don't want to get rid of that. <laughs> hey, Justin. And I know... Um, so we're just discussing trying to maybe pare the questions down to like 9 or 10. Okay, yeah, sorry for the delay. That's yeah. quite all right. I went to the police station. I didn't know what you just Oh, <laughs> you too, huh? You guys are all in trouble. <laughs> but I'm not alone. <laughs> I'll do better next time, I promise. As long as they didn't keep you there, that's all we that's care right. about. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, wow, what's going on? Maybe question 13 could be slashed. I think question 9 will cover. So, so yeah, from, from Aaron, from your list, I thought your, your first two were already covered in question 9 and question 5. Um, I don't know, maybe there was anything else you wanted to add to those. Uh, challenging the program wasn't really covered by any of the questions. I guess in general, from you and Chris, are there any of your questions that you feel particularly um, strongly about keeping? Like, out, of, out of the two of mine that are remaining, 16 and 17, I'm, I think the strongest of 17. You know, I, I think 16, 16 was originally kind of in the original question list, in other words, but it's not yep. on here anymore, so there, there must be a reason that it was... Um, yeah, you know, I, I think... It's you know, my opinion, kind of yeah, my opinion was that like a lot of that was already covered in the RFP, so if we're just yeah. in the interest of trying to cut it down a little yeah. bit. Um, yeah, I like, I like the, the post on the evaluation. Yep. So which, we're, which one are we losing? Uh, so far we've crossed off 16 and 18. And then 13 you think is duplicative? I uh, thought 13 and 14 were. Um, and we're similar to, to nine and five. I mean. I like the way 14 was written. Yeah. Um, I, I would almost say that 14 could be replaceable. 
I, I would I would or, second or that pending. because I just based on experience, and we got to be careful with that word selling because right, you know we're I I would selling I think we're editing. yep so um, but yeah I mean I think they're they're getting at the same thing I think so. yeah I think so how they're basically gonna how they're gonna convince the town that the project's the right project. So okay, so we're gonna strike, so we're gonna work strike five. Yep, keep strike, strike five. And strike thirteen. Strike thirteen. So then fifteen. Um, I don't know if that can be combined or. I know I'm a little bit late to this, but uh, fifteen is kind of like to me and all of my fellow firefighters. Anytime we see a fire station we're like ah oh, they just designed it to win an award it's not remotely useful so yeah. I, I know the town I grew up in they designed a public safety building and the fire station side of it was like had an aesthetically pleasing setback on that side of it so it wasn't just a straight across front and they can barely park their trucks in it so anything that addresses that line well okay so let, let's see if any of the others want to get so the only question, the only thing I would suggest, Kevin, you know, number 12, 12 is an easy, like, add it at the end kind of thing. It's, well, we're not really scoring it. Like, they've seen the schedule. They know we want to dive in. I, it's always good to confirm it, um, but I don't think it's, it, that's going to take up all of, like, 10 seconds. Sure. And, and I, Aaron had the suggestion of combining 1 and 12, which I think is good. And maybe that's one of the last questions we ask. Oh, okay. I think that's a great idea. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if during each of the presentations they're going to tell you. I, I don't disagree. So do you want to do that? You want to add 12 to 1? Yes. Okay. Moving that towards the end, or are we going to keep that as question one? Yeah, I, I think we can. My suggestion would be to have it near the end. Um, it just seems like kind of a question you would ask at the end, especially with the how quickly you're ready and to and commit. And expect to get a yes answer. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> that, that's what everyone should say. Okay, that's great. So that's and that leaves one, two, us with three, four, five. Oh, and then, yeah, combine three and four, four to make it one question. I thought that was a good idea. Six. So that gets us down to twelve. Three condition. Yeah. If you do that, I think that would probably result in a conflict with the contractor anyway. So if we combine three and four, that gets us down to one, two, three. I'm down to 12. Five, six, That's 12, seven, yep. Eight, nine, 10, 11. I, my other request, which I just remembered, was um, question eight. I was thinking that one through, and while a good question, I was wondering, I mean, should that needs to be asked, but does it need to be asked in interview? In other words, it's information that we need, but a great point. is it really going to make a difference between who we select as the architect? I, and I, I think, John, you made a, I think the, the first meeting we had when you were on bet, you said, don't get too hung up on the kind of the approach that they give you, just kind of weigh them on if you think that they have thought about the project. Right, the, specific, kind of right, don't, the, right the specifics, it just shows that they had they carried through a thought on a process and if the process isn't quite right that's okay it was more about you know the fact that they thought about it and didn't just mail it in um, so I, I I agree with with your point Aaron I think it's a uh, you know yeah I think it's looking, something that if we're looking to cut I think that's one I agree cut. Like an eight okay down to 11 I guess 
I mean, number 11, is that something that would come out just in the negotiation process? The only, so I guess this, this one is near and dear to us because I think we've started, <laughs> we've started to see, oh, I don't do that. I don't, you know, or that's excluded or what, and it's interesting to understand sometimes it's liability, some, you know, I, I guess it's a way to drive home. I, I guess you get to some of it by asking um, um, number six, because these buildings are complicated from the standpoint that there's other systems that are typically procured from other vendors. And it's, it, as Steve said, you know, he had on a job recently where, well, I don't coordinate that. Well, yeah, you do. You know, like you're not designing it, but you own a completed set of documents. And, and the concern isn't, you know, we've always, you know, well, we don't geotext and ad service. I, I, I know those things are fine, but it's more about what things do you typically exclude and say, I don't do this. I, and had, the, I had an architect that said, I don't do hazardous materials because my insurance won't let me touch it and at that point he was already on, on board and the owner had to take it on him, themselves which if we had known that probably would have had to factor it into his selection so that's when John well, says they near and dear they're not even willing to coordinate something then what what gets left off drawings that becomes a change order later because people right. didn't think about it I, I, I don't think I'm concerned about that with any of these firms having worked with the majority of them but it is worth having an understanding of what they so, you know. so maybe whoever has question six, it's, it's a follow-up question at the end once they explain their proposed approach and, and just say, you know, kind of as a follow-up, are there any other design services that you typically exclude? Yeah, I think that's fine. And I'm happy to ask that one, too. <laughs> I think that would be a good one for you. Okay, so, so, we'll, do, so we'll do six and 11, follow-up with 11. All right, you're at your 10. And just FYI, so the next time you see these sheet one day, I'll make these changes. Okay. So, do you have a particular order that you want to you want to reorder any of these? I, I, I was think, just thinking number one should be at the end. Other than yeah. that, keep it in line. Keep it in order. This order, yeah. I think. <coughs> okay. So one slash twelve is the last question. Yes. Okay. Last comment. All who's, right. Who's going to ask what? So, I know. Chief Kenny wanted to ask number nine. I'd like to take that seven if no one. I'm not sorry. Yeah, number seven. Okay. I'll take 14. Take 17. Nobody else wants 15. I can. I was kind of suggest that you seem passionate <laughs> about that one, so. I try to be even keeled when I ask it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we said John would take six. Yeah. Six, and, six, six and 11. Six and 11. Right, yes. Yep. I'll take 10 if that hasn't been taken. Otherwise, I'll take John. I'll take 10. Okay. I think the only other, I think the only question thing I would say with 10, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, I think this should say construction administration, not construction management. Yes, agree. Yeah, so so just let's change the word management, John, to construction administration instead of management. No type C services. Well, that's spoken like a true state guy. <laughs> Kevin, do you want to lead off with two? Sure, I can lead off with two. Steve doesn't have one yet. And then <laughs> <laughs> what do we got? Steve, Everybody else Steve take one. one I was going to say, Steve, do the last I got the last one. one. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. <clears throat> Save the heavy hitter for last. Yeah. <laughs> and who wants, who wants to take two? Oh, uh, oh three and four. I took, I took two. I meant. Uh, you guys want me to make photocopies? That way the next one is, I'll say, I'll fill them all out again. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Whoever has the best handwriting, I'll uh, take 
impairment. Now you tell me. We haven't assigned. Yeah. Did we assign three? We haven't assigned three slash four. Yeah. Um, Somebody's got to double up. Presenting, but some we leave somebody I, out. I mean, I could I could do that one too I, after I do number two. Sure, I'd take two in a row. Okay. Mic court, depending where they want to sit, I have 35 feet here. To, I don't know how you envision this going, but it makes it easier. My handwriting is the there. cleanest, but this is fine. I'll let you change it. On. You're all signed. Okay, we'll have it for next time. I don't want to touch it. <laughs> send a spark and shut this down. I'll, yeah, I'll set the charge. Sure. John, who's going to take that one? Okay. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it was good. that was combined. We combined it with. Yep. Um, yep, that's right. Power's down. What are you going to do without your power point? <laughs> so I'll give a little intro like we did last time. Because I'm so good at getting to go around the room. And I can't connect to the server. The room. Did Merit to saying and send it to me either, did you? No. You know that we're in the field, or these are all for no. Or that, like you know, I'm a structural engineer by these three. Yeah, yeah. Is that typical of building committees? We have this makeup of engineers. I don't know. Not necessarily. Not usually. <laughs> so I think that is good then, because it kind yeah. of puts them on their heels a little bit. Yeah. I've talked. Well, I don't know. I think some, like personally, I would feel better about it because you think that they're a little more educated about the process. Work with is on a committee in their town, and they recently told me that it's just full of opinionated people without <laughs> much background. Um, and that they're struggling. So I, I think it's good and rare that we have this. <coughs> they came in prepared for just uh, that level, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, engineer, 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 they might be like, uh, maybe we need to help the game. I hope, hope they <laughs> prepare for the. Uh, Prepare for the worst, but it's the best, I guess. <laughs> you realize after the fact, it has your name in this firm. Yeah, I, know, I already <laughs> filled it out. I already <laughs> filled it out. If you want me to hold up the uh, you want to go bike them down? Yeah. Um, you want me to go get them? Yeah, sure. Where would where do you envision they're going to sit, though? Oh, yeah, we don't want them blocked by the TV. You want to give them Aaron's space, like instead of a computer? I mean, I can get that we chair could, over there. We could. I can move it up there, right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. Yeah. Slide down. Yeah, well, they got space just, next to me. Yep. <laughs> I can split a bit. Where's your name kit plate going? Um, yeah, that's a good <laughs> question. <laughs> I'm a monitor. It's about good. There you go. Um, or you can sit in front of the side as well. I'm not. This is for this. Uh, this screen is just for the zoom for anybody that dials in. Yep. Yeah. Got it. And that HDMI hanging on the table there is what should connect to the TV behind you. Make your oh, Yeah, I think we should stand for the 
Lots of energy. Good. How's everyone? Good. How about yourself? Okay. Good. 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 Going to use us to work all the kinks out, right? Exactly. <laughs> That's okay. You get easy up. questions. Then, right? we, then we build up from there. Oh, okay. you, know? you will get your full allotted time, don't worry. <laughs> so do we need a HDMI? It's right here. I got it. Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll say a couple words to, to start once you're kind of ready. Kevin, I'll um, with microphones standing. There are microphones right there behind the computer, and it would be best if you're I'll using those time. when you're speaking. And at 15, I'll give them the heads up. All right. We'll just look for the green. Is there a light? <laughs> green light? You won't be able to hear it. As long as the light's green, you're good. Okay. So thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Um, this committee was formed uh, a few months ago, well, probably that now, six months ago or so, um, with the purpose of, of figuring out what to do with the, the fire station in the middle of town. It definitely is in, in need of some work. Um, the project as a whole kind of goes back a little further than that. It was originally proposed as a kind of a total public safety project to uh, move the police facility and also renovate or rebuild the fire station. The, the police station project went over budget um, and kind of left us where we are today, where we have enough money to, to get through nine here, but we need to the town to kind of move, move the project forward after that. So uh, our first few steps were obviously hiring an OPM. We've done that. And now the next critical step in, you know, in, in, our, in our process here is to get the right architect, right design team on board to kind of take us take us over the top. So um, with that, I'll just go around the room and introduce everybody. I'm Kevin Champagne, the committee chair. I'm a structural engineer by trade. Sure. Uh, Chris Baker, I'm uh, a civil engineer, a uh, geotech by trade. Hey, John Kent, I'm an energy project manager for the state. Justice, I'm a firefighter. Uh, Aaron Hunt, uh, arc by trade. Blythe Robinson, I'm a town administrator. Aaron Kenny, I'm the fire chief. John Lemieux, Vertex. Steve Kirby, Vertex. So with that, we'll let you go. Um, so I think John told you you have about 20 minutes, and then we'd like to hold 40 minutes for, for questions. Okay. We have a lot of information, so we'll try to get through <laughs> it in a, in a brisk manner. Sure. But uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to come in. So just a little bit of history. I've had the opportunity to work down in this area since 1996, having the original Delaney study addition, and then coming back with Doran Whittier in 2000 doing the second Delaney addition, which introduces to Philip. We did the King Philip Middle School, which uh, now in the early 2000s, a very challenging multi phase uh, uh, addition renovation project with students uh, fully occupying the building and uh, with minimal disruption. And after that, we did the addition renovation project over at, um, over, at the, over at the high school too. Another addition renovation project they occupied. So we welcome challenges. We know if we can do it with kids, we think we can do it with firefighters, uh, also. And uh, if that's where we're going here, and um, we're just excited to have been invited back. And those projects that I mentioned, I was the project manager for, so I was intimately uh, involved with the uh, with the community. So we're a firm of 57, Doran Whittier is. But the people you see here in front of you and the people you see here on the screen, we're the experience and the enthusiasm that's going to lead you from today all the way through the very end of the project. We don't do any pass-offs. We don't have departments. We are very integrated. We're very collaborative with them, amongst ourselves with you guys. So I'm going to be the, the principal in charge. Giovanna is the interior designer. Uh, Jason being our programmer and designer, and then uh, Ron being our project manager is our day-to-day -day contact. 
You only limited us to four, but we also have Glenn on the team, and he would have been here uh, if he fit in the room uh, as our project architect. And then our host of consultants, which um, we've worked with extensively over the lifetime of our experience uh, at Doran Whittier, so uh, we know each other intimately because uh, we work so much together. So in terms of our, our fire experience, we have quite a bit of it that we've done over the last few years. And as you can see, we worked uh, extensively in Massachusetts and a little bit throughout, throughout New England. Um, in terms of familiarity with this particular area, you may know we did the uh, Medfield Public Safety Building. Uh, we did uh, in Westwood, we actually did the Islington Fire Station and the Islington Police Station. We're actually, the Dedham Public Safety is under construction now. Uh, we're also working in Stoughton and Raynham and Easton right now on, on fire projects. And I also want to point out that we've done quite a bit of Department of Fire Services work. We're in Massachusetts doing the Fire Training Academy out in Springfield, working on a house doctor contract in Stowe, and um, in Connecticut doing a Fire Training Academy in Fairfield, and up in Vermont. So that's a lot of cutting head stuff with, with training and looking forward and seeing what's going to be coming next next for local fire stations. Uh, and right now we're actually doing a master planning study for the Department of Fire Services in Bridgewater. So a full planning study for their new campus that's going to be constructed there. In terms of our work, and we know it's important to design a building that's going to fit within your community, uh, we picked some of the projects that we thought may be most appropriate. Um, the uh, Medfield project is uh, a gateway to the his district. Uh, in Westwood, that was actually a driver for an, a new overlay district, uh, an economic driver for a new overlay district that they, uh, if you go in Islington now, it's completely been transformed. This was a driver for that. In Groton, we did um, a new facility there, built in a, in a historic farmer's field. So it's really, you know, a barn-like structure. Uh, up in Williston, Vermont, uh, something that had to fit within a quaint uh, New England village. And then up in, um, out in Springfield, Mass, uh, a Victorian residential neighborhood. So we've worked in all different scales, but what's important is that we want to make sure whatever we can for you fits within Norfolk, fits within the neighborhood, and fits on that particular site, which we'll talk about a little later. And we, but we've also done things that are more contemporary. You can see Wells, Maine. You can see the Dedham um, Public Safety in Stoughton, Mass, the uh, fire station that we're developing. And then lastly, in Boston, the first new fire station that they've designed in 30 years. We're fortunate enough to get that, and that's going to be opening here in the next month. So with that being said, I'm going to roll over to Giovanna. <laughs> we'll switch places. Okay. Um, thanks, John. So I always say um, we have the best job in the world, right? We get to transform ideas and thoughts into spaces that uh, get used and a fire station really gets used you think of all the different functions that need to happen in this one building We have trucks and equipment that need to be stored cleaned maintained There's all different kinds of training and then there's living quarters in these spaces as well, and they're all really important It's so important to think about these spaces and make them inviting but also with healthy materials and systems so for the occupants themselves, but then also to be maintained over time. We want to set the department up for success. We know how important um, a fire station is to these firefighters. This isn't just where they work, this is where they live as well. There really is this, this pride there. Um, we think of all these different types of spaces and Jason's really going to get into how we define this list. And once they're defined and then we think about how to separate them so that the dirty stay with the dirty and the clean stay with the clean. This is for the best overall health of the occupants and the visitors alike. Then it's our job to transform these spaces into inviting spaces, again, that can be maintained over time. And it's just so important. So with that, I'll hand it off to Jason. Okay. Thank you. So programming and planning is, it's a big general topic, but there's three things I really hope that you can take away from this. One is we do everything in-house. Um, we spent the last six years or so developing our own process to do programming and planning in-house. Um, we don't use an outside consultant, and that's really important because not only will I program the building with you, 
I will do the space planning, I will do the design, and I will stay all the way through construction. So there's really a continuity that goes all the way through and a familiarity with the entire process. Um, also, we want to make the process as engaging as possible and get the best information out while we're doing this. So what we've done is we've developed an online questionnaire that we use. Um, very easy to use and this is really engaging with the, the department, with all the users and this can be distributed to everyone who's in the department or a select group of people or just chief. Uh, however you want to work, we can customize it and work with you in whatever way you see fit. But this really gives us great information that becomes the foundation of the project. And then we take all of that great information and we, we go through a very robust, detailed process. And the level of detail that we go through is really critical because it's a really accurate understanding by the end of the programming process of what this project is going to look like going forward. Um, you can see you've got a uh, space summary from 2015 that was uh, listed. It's a little different, I think, than the numbers that were in the uh, RFQ. One of the things we would want to do is establish where some of those differences are. Um, but as we go through the program, this is an example on the here. We go through everything line by line. We'll sit down with you, go through a series of meetings, three, four meetings usually, um, and really break down every single space within the building. Um, but we don't just go through that and, and give you a suggestion on how big we think those spaces should be. We will prioritize those spaces with you, so we assign a high, medium, low priority so that as we go through the process, if there are things that need to change, we understand how to make those changes appropriately. We also will really early on start establishing hot zones, um, security zones, things of that nature. We also put future growth right in the programming process up front. There's a lot of other detailed information in here that I won't share tonight, but um, it's, it's a very robust process. I think what's important too is that it becomes very thought provoking. Mm -hmm. You've already done a study, you, you have a sense for what you need. Every single time we've come in after someone who's done an earlier study, we find more spaces that, oh, did you think about? That's right. And we ended up, end up adding those into the uh, process also. Right. And, and the other piece of that is we take all the information from every project and we add that to the following project. So every project that we work on, or if we work on this project, you get the experience and of all of the previous projects that have come before it. So I update those uh, standards after every project. Uh, we'll also go process of room data sheets and diagrams so you'll understand how every single space is planned and programmed and everything that goes into that. And we track that all the way through the project. This needs analysis doesn't just happen in the feasibility study. We update it through every stage of the project so we can track the changes as we go through. All right, hot zones obviously become very important, critical in the planning process. Um, now with the updates to NFPA 1500 and 1581 that have just happened this year, those have now become mandatory, really part of the process. Um, it, it's, it's written like a code to this point. So it's critical to understand how all of this works. We help Boston um, develop their standards on how they work, how they uh, do the decon sequence, um, how everything flows through the building, all of the separations, uh, airlocks, mechanical systems, all of that we help them develop and we'll be able to bring all of that knowledge forward. I think as you probably know, Commissioner Finn was a driver That's right. trying to create safe separations within fire facilities, so we got to, to gain the knowledge from him while we were sharing our knowledge at the same time. That's right. <clears throat> Uh, in addition, um, one of the things we do is we look at training opportunities to build into the building. Um, there are things like confined space training, hose and ladder training, other types of training that you can do at very low cost, building it right into the structure of the building. And then other opportunities on the site, burn buildings, props, things of that nature that can be done and that we're very familiar with with our work for, uh, with the state. So great training opportunities built in. Uh, one of the other things that we, we tend to build in, and I'm going to pass this off, is uh, sustainability gets right built into our projects. So as the day-to-day -day project manager, I'll be making sure that all of this gets done on time and on schedule. Um, and one of the things about built-in is we know you're a green community. And everything we do has sustainability baked into it. So we're very familiar with NBI and WELL and LEED and BREAM, um, accredited and WELL accredited. So that goes into the WELL building. And if we go to the next slide, all of those measures and strategies from all of these different programs, we're not going to impose anything on you, 
what we want to do is take a look at the energy use of the building because all of this is about a healthy building for the fire department and driving down operational costs. So what we do is we spend time looking at the EUI, which is the energy use intensity of a building, which is how much energy do you use in one year. And we look at that from a HVAC perspective as well as a lighting perspective, and most firms stop there. But we actually, if you look at this chart here, you can see that plug loads, especially in a building like this, have a big effect. Um, your kitchen loads, this is 24 7 3 5 facility. Um, so what we want to do is drive down all of the energy use in this building before we start talking about, okay, how do we make it renewable? You know, how do we bring in renewable systems? And how we do that is we take a look at the no-cost items. So over the years, energy efficiency has become a big thing. Um, codes have changed. The IECC, the, the mass stretch codes, you have a green community, so you know about that. So we take a look at all the strategies and measures that won't cost you anything up front, because we're always focusing on cost. But then we also want to talk about the strategies and measures and systems that have a 10-year payback. Because even though that might add a little bit to the project, if you can get that money back in 10 years and you're still paying down the bond, you start reaping those benefits. And to that same point, the 10 and 20 year payback, there are systems and opportunities and equipment that you may choose to go that route. Because again, once your bond is paid off, you're now reaping all those benefits. And everything we do is sort of cost driven. We want to make sure that as, as we're doing the design, everything is cost effective and managed well, and time is money. And so as we start investigating the design and the planning process, we want to talk about and investigate. Maybe we do a two-phase project where you talked about maybe the fire station is a replacement station. So we build a new one, and then two phases as you build the new, knock down the old, and finish the site work. But let's also talk about an addition and renovation. Um, what if it is an addition renovation or some kind of multi-phased project? Well, we want to talk about that in terms of time. So is it a 12 to 18 month project or is it an 18 to 24 month project? Because what's the return on investment for the taxpayers and how does the fire department live through 18 months of construction versus 24 months of construction? And the cost control and the estimating is also something we believe will be very important to your project, especially with the research that we've done. And again, the green community and um, getting everybody involved in the community. We can take a look at estimating. So we work very extensively with PM and C, our estimator, and we wanna make sure that this part of the feasibility study, our estimates are true and dead on. And we test that by doing schematic design estimates, design development estimates, and then three estimates during the construction documents. The benefit of that to you is like many of our projects, when we estimate these over time, we start at a feasibility study, and as we go through, they become refined, and we've been fortunate enough that the bids come in less than the estimates. Um, not only do the bids come in less than the estimates, but the team that we have here today is going to put together a set of documents, so the document-related change orders, again, fortunate enough that all these projects have come in less than 1% in those change orders. I think what's important about Peter Bradley at PMC, he doesn't just work for us. He works for many uh, public designers in Massachusetts. So he has a lot of information from other projects that we may not be involved with at the time. So keeping ahead of the market is just so important. And as you know, what we saw with recent COVID spike in material costs and supply chain issues, he's on top of that. So we're constantly monitoring that, always looking forward to see when this particular project is going to be available for construction. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we start off with is a facility study. We want to know about the obstacles. Why doesn't this building work anymore? What's the problems in this building? What's the problem that we're trying to solve? And we'll find that out when we do the analysis of the building. We would then move on to the site and do that same type of analysis. Um, we've, already, we've seen that you've already started in terms of clearing the site. Um, we want to take a look at what is the site condition, not only from a sustainability point of view, but a point of view. So how does this transition to if we want to do a new versus an addition of renovation, how does it touch the street, the property lines, the church next door, uh, the neighbors um, on each side and across the street? And if we were to do a two-phase approach, we again, without even speaking to you yet, and you're going to bring a lot to this process, obviously, um, but what we've already done is said, do they have the room on the site if they wanted to build a new station? and then knock down the old 
um, and finish the site work. We believe that you do. Um, but again, this is from 30,000 feet. We'll get into the details. And then if we want to do an addition and renovation, or if we want to sort of build one piece, like for instance, the administration, then the administration moves in, we knock down the administration and build new bays, and then we knock down the bays and the bays move over. You know, however we want to do this, whether it ends up being an addition and renovation or new, um, we can do that. We also have experience like we did in Boston, where right now your housing is sort of in a separate building, uh, the, the dormitories. Well, what about kitchens and bays? You know, we've brought in temporary um, spaces like that uh, in order to accommodate this type of multi-phased um, approach. Boston did not have the luxury <laughs> of having anything else on site. The contractor barely fit on site. Imagine the situation. And what this does is we're exploring all this and we're talking about all this and we got the community engaged and the neighbors engaged is we're gonna find the right solution. It's not a preferred solution. Pick A, B, or C. That's not the point here. The point here is that we investigate this so that we come up with this custom, as Don said, this beautiful building that belongs in, in Norfolk, and it's the right solution. And everybody, from the fire department down to the community members to the leaders in town believe this is the right solution. So in talking about the community and how to engage the community, we feel that just communicating is not enough it needs to be engaging it needs to be more than just here's the information um, and so we're really committed to that and there's lots of different ways we have a simple timeline of the project and in the beginning there's a lot of engagement with the community a lot of different talks but that doesn't go away that maintains throughout the project and there's lots of different ways that we can do that so we have many different tools, some digital, some in person. We do find that lots of different sized um, engagement opportunities works really well. Some will be smaller, more intimate with the public, putting up our sleeves, exploring different ideas, answering their questions, thinking about what are their needs, what are their thoughts. And then there's some more large events, which we can have question and answer sessions and really get into the why. Why is a 50 year building important? Why are healthy materials and systems in? Why is sustainability important? These are all things that the common community member doesn't know and that leaves them with questions. We don't need questions. We want everyone to know what they're getting from the very beginning. They can be excited and proud of this thing. Um, how do we engage those people that maybe left out in the past and didn't, you know, felt like know what was going on? We looked at your um, this information. You have a lot of young families. Is there an opportunity to reach out to the schools, to the local PTOs, talk to some of the parents, make them the project champions, invite them to sessions? Um, so that we can engage them. COVID really pushed us to find different ways to interact with people. We love this asynchronous system. We can post a bunch of images. <laughs> Come on, two more minutes. We can post a bunch of pictures to a website and then parents after the kids have gone to bed can log in, make comments, see if they like it. Simply seniors who maybe can't get a ride somewhere, but they wanna be involved or they have limited mobility, they can log on and answer those questions. Uh, so we can engage with them throughout the process. And then ultimately, when we get to a design that we love and we're proud of, we can provide you with really realistic renderings, flybots, and all this information can be pushed out on social media. Again, so your community knows what they're getting. Transparent is not enough. We need to listen, we engage, and we're prepared to do that. <laughs> Thanks, John. This is, this is your building. <laughs> this is dead of public. Yeah, I don't know if that one will fit. Yeah, yeah. probably, probably yeah. not. But I uh, just want to leave you with, I mean, these are actually what past clients have said about us in what it's like to work with Dorn Whittier. We are really passionate about, about doing this, and uh, I don't think you'll find anyone more detailed or more collaborative than Dorn Whittier. So thank you for your, uh, your time. And John, your muffins are ready. <laughs> I thought about changing the tone, but <laughs> so that, that usually gets everybody. Thanks. So I, I know 20 minutes is tough. That's okay. Um, but we have a lot of good questions here, so I think you'll have an opportunity to really yeah. kind of expand yeah. on 
of some I of swear we shown. did this in 19 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so my first question is um, just to understand the construction bid process. Um, so if you can explain a little bit about the construction bid process and your role and then what you see uh, the town's role. With, with the bid process? Yes. Yeah, so the first thing, and I, I think the, the change order is attributable to design team less than 1%, says a lot about our documentation. So we, we have been doing this a very long time. You know, 85% of our work is Massachusetts public work. So we're extremely familiar with design bid build. We're extremely familiar with the CM at risk process. So that's something that we'll be talking about relatively early in, in the process, right? Are we going to do a hard bid or are we going to go see them at risk? And a, a building sitting behind the existing building, relatively easy to conduct, easy to cordon off from the daily operations, that's a good candidate for design bid build. If we get into a situation where we have to be very invasive with people occupying the building, doing additions, doing renovations, that could be a good candidate at risk, which is not to say you couldn't do a big build because that's how we always did until the CM at risk process uh, came around. So determining uh, how we're going to bring the project forward will be discussed early and, and, and quite a bit until we figure out what the, uh, the best solution is. In terms of the actual bidding itself, we will work closely with John and Steve. We develop all the bid documents in terms of the, the drawings and the specifications. Uh, we will work with John and Steve in the town on the front end documents, basically the legalese that goes uh, up front for how the, uh, the, basically the project is going to march forward. And then we'll, we'll administer it. We're going to uh, work with you to administer those documents and release them to the, uh, to the bidders. Um, as you, you may know, there are, there are two steps to the process, regardless of of which method you choose to uh, build the project. You either you have a file sub, sub bid bidders or file sub bid trade. If you go see them at risk, which bids first, uh, generally about anywhere from 12 to 15 categories, depending on uh, what's, what's in the building. And then what happens is we open those bids and then the bids uh, for the general contractor are open uh, probably a week or two weeks later with those numbers provided to the general contractor who takes those and make those, makes those all, all part of their bid. So throughout that entire process where, where, as I said, we issued the documents, we'll issue any addenda in response to RFIs, uh, we'll conduct the uh, site walks uh, that will occur. Uh, we're, we're basically leading, leading that whole charge. Uh, but it, it really is a side-by-side -side with, with John and Steve and with you as, with as, as active as you want to be. Sometimes we see uh, committee members who want to help lead uh, that discussion on the site. Sometimes they want to just stay in the back. We're, we're comfortable either way uh, we're doing that. But uh, we know how important it is to, um, to administer that, that project, uh, that process. The other thing is, having done this for such a long time, we're familiar with a lot of, of the bid bidders in, in the state. <coughs> So getting the word out early about the project, letting them know what's coming, bidding it at a time that's beneficial to you in terms of getting, getting the best bids, looking at what's coming up in the marketplace. What we have historically seen is that bidding near the end of a calendar year or beginning of, a, of the next calendar year uh, generally works to your benefit because there's still that mindset that you're trying to make your book for the following year. So contractors tend to look at that very aggressively as they try to fill their their void looking out a year, year and a half uh, beyond for a project of this duration. I just said a lot. Yeah. Did I get that? <laughs> is there is there is there more? Um, it could be said is there more you want to hear? I thought that was a pretty pretty succinct <laughs> complete answer. So anything in particular that drove that question? Like if you has something come up in the past that you want to know how we would address it or so I, I think um, I was just curious you know I, at, 
in my line of work, I'm a subconsultant typically to the architect, so I'm not on the owner's side to know exactly what their role in that whole process is. Mm -hmm. So. Between us, you'll get to sit back, relax, right. and enjoy the process. <laughs> yeah, and wait for the numbers to come in. Sure. Okay. Um, so now we're through the bid process. We're into construction. Um, kind of walk us through maybe a, a past project where uh, a latent condition that resulted in an unexpected cost came up, um, and and how was how did you work through that and mitigate that? The the, I mean, the first thing is if, if something is to come up get the information out right away. Don't sit on it, get the inf information out right away. I think we talked about transparency in our presentation, and that is hugely important. Um, if, if you don't do that, that's to everyone's demise because things can fester and they become something worse than, than they need to be. Uh, I will say uh, we, we haven't had a lot of uh, major issues, but um, in Groton, uh, I mentioned that was in a historic farmer's field before the, the town took it over to actually build the fire station, uh, we had to go out there and do our geotechnical analysis, right? So uh, when we went out and did it, it, it was made very clear that because it was still an active field, we couldn't do test pits, only do borings. And, you know, borings are less invasive, basically. Test pits, while you're, you're gonna fill it back in, you know, because of the crop, they didn't want us to uh, to, uh, to disturb it too much, so we did. We did borings only. We got results on, on what the material was. Uh, we found that and it was done in August, which is say based upon the schedule. So we found out that groundwater was a good 20 feet down below uh, below the surface. And um, what was discovered during construction, which of course excavation was taking place in March, was that there was a perch groundwater. We discovered in the back of the site uh, beyond the building footprint that there was some some striation of shale and it was creating this situation where water was coming off of a back hill and it wasn't able to to permeate down into the soils so we, we needed to address that and what we did was uh, and it didn't affect the building at all but it did affect the back parking lot so working with our geotechnical uh, engineer we developed a system with a uh, with a geomat to reinforce what was a parking area, a turning around area for apparatus to, uh, to mitigate what, were, you know, what was a latent condition but uh, unsuitable soils back there. So the lesson learned is, have a, wasn't our conversation, but have a more detailed conversation with the farmer. Let him know we'll bring it back to like field condition and get those test pits done too. Because with that, you would have seen this dryations in those soils back there. You would have seen the staining from any of the, the uh, spring uh, rise in the groundwater. And we maybe, maybe we would have had that uh, design for that back parking lot resolved during the uh, construction documents, as opposed to having to do it as part of the change order. So I guess as a kind of related question, and you can certainly use that example if you want, but um, uh, for something that came up that ultimately turned into a conflict with the, the contractor, you know, how did you resolve that? Um, I don't know if you wanted, if if there was any conflict resulting from that I, I, discussion I, or if there's a better example that you want yeah, to Yeah, no, I, 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 we, we could stick with that. I mean, that was clearly an unforeseen condition. Um, one could argue that you you could have found it had you done, and that's, that's fine. If we had done, we may have known, but, but nobody knew, right? So uh, when it's uncovered, what you do is you go out and you uh, determine the best way to, to remedy it, which in this case was this geotechnical uh, solution. You work with the contractor uh, to develop cost uh, based upon the documents that we would then issue. Um, and then you review the cost uh, with the OPM, with the owner, determine what's, what works best for the contractor, for the owner. And ultimately, because it was an unforeseen condition, that's something that is paid to the contractor uh, to do what is extra work to them. So I think in working with the contractor, um, none of us are going to be out there swinging a hammer, right? So it's in everyone's best interest uh, to make sure that there's a great working relationship. And not every latent condition turns into additional costs. Uh, we had a situation with Ledge where, again, did borings and Ledge isn't exactly straight, right? up and down 
and we hit more ledge. So the contractor came and said, well, we can whole ram all this out, which basically means we're going to bang it all out. But we analyzed the ledge, and the structural engineer reduced the depth of the footings and pinned it to the ledge. So we got a credit for the concrete, we got a credit for the digging that they had anticipated doing, and the structural fill they anticipated on bringing in. So I think um, one thing is to really, when we do sit down with the contractor, is put our heads together and figure out the best return on investment um, for an owner, no matter what the latent condition is. Um, because the contractor wants to save time, right? So when contractors say they don't like change orders, it's not because they don't make money on it. It's because it ruins their schedule. And it gives everybody an excuse. Um, so when a co good contractor takes all those excuses away, if we can save them time, save you money, um, and we can resolve these things, it benefits everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, explain your firm's approach to fire station systems like station alerting, security, um, radio, communication, those sorts of things. In your mind, who designs them? And in your approach, who's responsible for the overall coordination? Yeah, well, first of all, we're, we're soup to nuts. So with our engineers, we, we design all those systems and we, we, we build them into the project. Um, it, it's, it's been a little different with, with different owners with how they want to handle uh, the procurement of that. Um, the plug-in, all the infrastructure is going to be built into the, to the construction. So uh, your general contractor and your electrical subcontractor is going to have all that infrastructure uh, built in. The, the plug-in equipment is what we've done differently on different jobs. Sometimes we'll handle the procurement of that. Sometimes it's handled through the, through the OPM. Um, and it can be uh, done through a bidding situation. Some of it can be done through state bidders list. So um, we've done it multiple different ways. But ultimately, uh, what we what we like to do and for the coordination aspect of it is is keep control of that. So you still have that one that one stop shopping. What do you like best? What which approach do you like best? Well, I guess we always like to control things when we can. Right. I mean, build it all into the job and have the GC own it well, all? Well, no, not the, the plug-in equipment, not necessarily, because, as we know, technology continues to go down in cost, and it continues to advance in, in, in how it's put together. So often what will happen, like furnishings and equipment, is that we'll, we'll wait till later in the job to procure that to have it installed, either through the GC or through a separate vendor. So it can be done either way. And one way that's similar to furniture to really utilize the contracts gives you a lot more control over what you're getting. So if you want a particular brand, so a system that works with your system, you utilize the contracts, then you can get that exact thing as opposed to putting it out to bid or putting it in the hands of someone else. Um, it gives you a lot more control to, to wait. Yeah. Radio equipment is, is one example of working with the vendors too and we'll work hand in hand with the vendors, vendors that you currently may use, um, and make sure that you're really getting the right equipment for the job going forward. So that's something that we want to start as early as possible, uh, working with them. So an another route to go there. And I, and, I, and I guess I'll, I'll reinforce that we want to control it. I was just thinking of Boston. <laughs> yeah. and, and they have right. a, a different station alerting system than, than we would typically use. Right. And, um, and, and they're controlling that right now. And it's, it's, it's something that probably hasn't been installed as soon as it should have been. So. Okay, great. And, and kind of along those lines, you control, so I get an idea of how you're going to answer this one. You know, the town expects full to services for this project, especially with the history and, and everything else. Do you normally have any exclusions to your scope? And if so, why? As far as types of subconsultants that you know, we don't own them, and is there is there anything that falls in that category? No, we've we've so. owned everyone at, at, at some point. Some some communities come to us and say, well, we have a survey for you, we have a geotechnical engineer for you, we have a hazardous material consultant for you, but I mean that's few and far between now. I mean, typically we we, we carry those services, and uh, we're completely comfortable doing that. Okay, great, thank you. And to your question about coordination, we're going to coordinate all of it, whether. If you say to us you want to go out and get your own control system or your own, um, you know, fire-specific system, 
we're still going to coordinate. We will sit down with you and the electrical engineer and the plumbing engineer and the HVAC or whoever, you know, and yourself obviously, and need um, to sit down and go over it. So whether it's in our contract to design it, we're still going to make sure everything's completely coordinated and managed and scheduled uh, so that these things go in as they should. Great, thank you. Sure. So I, took, I very much took note of your slide about the fact that your change orders are low, and I'm very glad to hear that. Um, however, having been involved with public projects for, for a number of years, um, I've seen too many times where that coordination doesn't happen, and the thing that needs to be plugged into the wall, there's no plug for it you know, when it gets there. How, just to help us understand how your firm approaches with your subconsultants making sure that those plans and specifications are thorough and not just the copy paste of the way they always do it um, that won't re result in change orders during the project because I care about the money. Sure. sure. And, and we care about your money too. Because Good answer. Yeah, because because <laughs> it's not just your it's not just your money it's the entire community and all that. I, I think the, the community's money I think. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Um, it, it actually starts with that guy down the end of the table, who's super detailed, um, who is super responsive, is is someone who, gosh, he, he just he, he's the guy who just has his arms around everything, and, and knows what's going on throughout the entire project. That's not to say that any one of us goes anywhere. Thought we just have our different roles. You know, I'm, I'm more of, a, of an overseer. That's that's the guy who is in charge of everything that goes on. Here's your program and design together with the interior design. And we didn't mention the you know, furnishings and equipment. We do that also uh, through Giovanna. But I, I think one thing that may set us apart is that we have three individuals within our office who are senior associates uh, in the firm. And they are our, our quality control gurus. So they kind of slip uh, between myself and Ron and our job captain and they are our independent review of all of our documents because they've got the history of every project in the office which is it's so important like we all work on projects but we don't see every project they see every project so they know what's going on out there uh, in where we may have quite frankly missed something because we're not perfect and uh, that's I think that's important to note there there will be a change or two uh, we, we certainly try to minimize it, but between John, Dave, and Mark, they do a super job at overseeing the documents from feasibility, schematic design, design development, right through construction documents, and they stay involved during construction administration. So while we take the history and carry it through the entire project, so when you get into construction administration and you say, well, why the heck did you do that? We have the answer. You don't hand it off to a construction administrator in our office because we don't have that person. That happens right here at this level. But that happens with Dave, Mark, and John, too. They're right there with us, and they provide us with that, that guidance all along the way. Yeah, and I think Jason showed an image of the RIM data sheets. That's something that we really take, um, and we do the RIM data sheets for every single room at the beginning of the project, and then we come back with the layout of that actual room. So in the beginning, it might be a training room. We need seats for 50 people. We need marker boards, so it's more generic later in the project, we're going to come back and do that process again with the actual layout of that room. Where does the coffee machine go? Where does the water go? Where does the projector go? And really go through all of that, update our room data sheets, and then transfer that through the documents. And then our QAQC guys will look at those room data sheets and say, you know, you needed um, a copy machine in this room. I don't see any electric for that. All right. I don't see the place for the copy machine. I'm just using that as one example. But so it's it's multi-layered and it's that continual conversation from the beginning all the way to the end. Our consultants get those sheets as well. So it's not just us looking at it in-house. We sit down with our consultants. They get all the room data sheets and we'll go through those as well to make sure that the systems match up to what we're providing in the rooms. Thank you. And we, we probably haven't spoken about the consultants enough. But between Niche Engineering, uh, Engineers Design Group, Niche is our civil, Engineers Design Group is our structural, and Garcia Gillespie de Souza is our MEP, uh, FP engineers. We've done so many, like, we're talking about 20, 30, 40 projects together. So we, we're, 
in many ways like one big office. But like with Peter Bradley, who does all our cost estimating, we get the benefit of what they learn on other projects too. So um, they're coming right along with us uh, throughout the entire process. All right. Um, a major concern our department staff is their living quarters. Currently, the staff inhabit a mobile home, which has become undersized as the department has grown over the, over the years. What is your firm's approach to tackling temporary quarters, relocating operations? Um, how would you make this matter a priority? And how do you provide a cost-benefit analysis of the different options? We may have a deal for you. <laughs> in Boston, right. they just stopped using theirs. Yeah, that's true. Um, so we, we went through and, and we designed a, a, a fabric structure for the apparatus, but we also have a uh, modular for their, their living office and uh, uh, day room and, and uh, kitchen area. So that actually, yeah. that really might be available. And, <laughs> and that we wasn't an off the shelf. We actually designed the layout of that trailer to specifically work for the department during that uh, period of time that they were there. So we want to make sure that even the temporary facilities are going to meet your needs you know, during that construction process. Um, so we'll sit down with you and we'll go through that. And we put together a whole set of drawings dedicated just to those temporary facilities. Right. And, and we, we've done enough modular construction, not just um, uh, for temporary uh, fire living quarters, but for classrooms. We've done a lot of school work too. So we're very familiar with that particular market. Uh, we've worked with William Scotsman in particular. I mean, they're just all over the place. And uh, you know, we, we could work with someone like that to help with some of the early pricing uh, also. So uh, yeah, we, we, can, we can get into that in a lot of detail uh, with you. And th these temporary facilities, I mean, you're going to live in there, right, if we decide to go that route? So we've got to think about heating and cooling and right. acoustics. You know, it's not just about here, here's a space for you. It's what is the comfort and the health of that space because you're in there, you know, for a good length of time. And you're working out of there too. Right, communications is a big piece right. of that. You know, if you're in that trailer and a call comes in, you need to know right away. So we want to make sure that that really is working for you. And, and, we, and we separate the apparatus and all your, right. all your support for the apparatus bay from the the living space. So while it's not as robust as you're going to have in a, in a new facility, there is a, a definite separation between the uh, between the two. Can you uh, describe your firm's approach to construction administration? Um, what are your practices or your uh, standard operating procedures when it comes to keeping projects running smoothly, verifying adherence to construction documents, responding to RFIs? Yeah, so um, as we mentioned, we, this is the group that's going to be carrying this right through construction. So um, basically the way we handle construction administration is to, to, to set up, uh, basically establish a relationship with the contractor, right? So right from the get-go, we'll sit down and have a meeting uh, with the contractor, with all the uh, uh, subcontractors, with the OPM, with the owner, and we'll establish uh, basically protocols. Right? How we're going to submit RFIs, how we're going to go through uh, change order proposals, how we're going to uh, deal with the monthly uh, application payments, payments for application, and establish that right up front so everyone knows uh, what's going on. And that's built into our specification. So it's not a surprise. So people are, people are owning this because they're bidding it, because it's, it's built right into our uh, our documents but sit down and, and so everyone has that understanding with a uh, meeting just like this and then in, in, in terms of the actual administering of the uh, of the project uh, it's it's a it's a day-to-day hour-to-hour week-to-week uh, kind of a little bit of a grind right because you're gonna have uh, a lot of submittals uh, coming in and we establish a submittal schedule uh, we actually ask the contractor to provide that um, for some reason it doesn't always make it the way we'd like it to to show up but uh, we get a, a, a schedule of, uh, of submittals uh, that are established and worked through um, 
-hmm. Some subcontractors are faster than others, so they try to slip in uh, the door hardware before the, the roofing material is in. So we'll, we'll review that, but we might say, look, can this, can this sit back while we focus on the structure? Right? Get, get your steel done. Which, and that's part of the relationship that we hope to establish with the contractor so they understand that. Just because they, they submitted it and we've got the 14-day uh, the clock for review, we, we try to do it in a common sense way. So if you're going to barrage us with 100 submittals, we want to focus on these first 10, the next 10, and so forth throughout. And that, that's, worked, that's worked well. Mm -hmm. Where most contractors are understanding. They're just trying to help push, push their job through also. So, um, and we go back and forth uh, sometimes depending on the submittal. If it's, if it's not thorough enough, um, if, if it's to a point where it just needs to be resubmitted, we'll do revise and resubmit it and they'll have to kick it back through the process. Uh, often there'll be some minor uh, adjustments that need to be made, so we'll approve it as noted. So with our markups, they can move forward in, to the next step of, uh, of ordering their materials or their systems to put in. Um, and then we're on the site uh, weekly and, and or as needed to, uh, to observe the, uh, to either to both have a site meeting and observe the work in place, uh, working closely with the site representative from the, uh, the Vertex's office on a daily basis. So uh, we're all up to speed with uh, what's going on together. Um, but so that, that's kind of the, the general tenor of it. In terms of RFIs, you know, they come in, we turn them right around. Uh, change order proposals, they come in, we discuss it, we talk with the OPM, we talk to the owner, we uh, reply to those. Application for payment, very important to have that draft ap application in, you know, probably the third week of the month, so they can do the final by the end of the month and then get into your queue for payment, which if that's not the end of the month, it could be the middle of the month, some, how some towns work. So you know, we, we just do our best to try to keep everything moving forward in a, in a positive and a, uh, in a smooth manner. So it's a very managed process. Yeah. And so just like we talked about time is money, we're here to help you design your fire station, and we're here to help the contractor build it right. right. And so all of the time we spend <coughs> on site on a weekly basis, sometimes twice a week, um, you know, that's not because we want to be here. That's because we want to be here for the contractor. We want to answer his questions. We want to make sure he does. He knows everything because the more he knows, the better job he does. Um, so we don't frown upon questions when we get submittals. If there's something that we need to work through the submittal, we'll absolutely work through the submittal with the contractor, with the OPM. Make sure everybody's on page, uh, the same page when it comes to what needs to be done. And I think that philosophy of CA is that we're all collectively taking ownership and watching this building go up and go up right. And I think that's what helps us be successful. Uh, managing change orders. Right. Our, our QA QC team is, is very much involved in that process as well. So every document that comes in and goes back out during CA goes through our QA QC process as well. So they're overseeing everything, making sure that nothing has been missed, and making sure that everything that the contractor submitted matches what was designed and what the design intent was. So um, it's a very thorough process. I just want to emphasize this is not an adversarial situation right this is really a, a, a team approach collaborative approach with everyone involved <laughs> will there be disagreements absolutely but you need to be able to resolve those disagreements as they arise and not carry whatever that disagreement was forward and uh, it comes to you you resolve it you move forward and um, I, I can honestly say in all our years we have not had a bad project because we just couldn't get along with the contract Okay, just a quick heads up. We got four questions left, and we've got ten minutes. Well, that's good because we got all the softball questions. Out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> all right, my turn. Uh, our police station project. Uh, Kevin mentioned you may have heard it didn't go well. Uh, it was over budget. It was late. Um, all kinds of questions about fiscal responsibility. Um, for, you know, as a town, there's history there, and it's going to carry over to this project. And, um, you know, we understand the approach about having a good plan and being transparent and communicating and all the, all the right things to do, but um, 
we're wondering if you might have a ace up your sleeve or you know what's your go-to move to you know talk to the public in a difficult situation and explain to them that hey look we're doing what we can to control the situation and it's going to work out better than it did last time wow um i I think it's a little bit of everything that we've been saying yeah it it, it it really is about constant communication and, and Giovanna spoke to that uh, during her section about communicating with the with the public uh, clearly the public's tuned into what's going on right they they know where you are today I sus- we suspect and um, and bringing them along is, is so important but um, asking them to be involved at some level I think is good too. get get those questions out now so we can be addressing them along the way just as when something comes up with a contract you don't want it to fester you don't want things to fester uh, in, the, in the public either um, so we need to constantly do our best to to address whatever those concerns might be I think in a in a civic situation it's um, you feel like well we've put all the information out there you know people aren't reading it or you know, you have town meeting once or twice a year, and a hundred people come or two hundred people come out of a town of thousand. So a lot of I come from a, a smaller town. We just did a police station that I look at out my window, and like a lot of these same, you know, people have have baggage and they feel jilted. Like, where's my money going? So I think it's so important to get them involved. You know, it's that's what I meant by it's not just enough to say, oh, here here's a pretty building. Why? Why are? Why is it this size? Um, really get them involved because these are the questions they have. Well, why does it need to be that big? And why did it cost this much money? Or why do we need to have solar panels? You know, it's all those questions. But if they're involved early and maybe reaching out to different groups that you wouldn't typically think need to be involved in a fire station. Um, and I just use the the PTO as an example, but maybe it's the you know a group that goes to the library or different groups in town so it's not just an information session we're not just talking at them but we're actually getting them to roll up their sleeves and um, be involved so they know the why then they can tell their friends the why and get the information out that way I think that really helps Uh, no doubt it sounds like there's some um, hurt feelings out there and and we'll have to repair that but you know Dedham Public Safety might be a, a good example um, there was some projects that maybe weren't managed to the best of their ability in the past in the town some of the community members were a little jaded and I, you know I think I lost track of the number of meetings that we went through meeting with the public reassuring them helping to educate them but then also getting their input we, we changed the design of the building um, and the look and feel of the building based on that community feedback because we really wanted to make sure we got buy-in from the town, uh, from the community. It was really important to get that project to go through because there was that history um, and you know they were a little uncertain about how things would go moving forward. But ultimately it was very successful and it's now under construction. Um, and uh, I, th- I think that was, there were a lot of good lessons learned that came out of that. Thanks. Uh, go ahead. No, no, it's fine. Uh, from my perspective uh, as a firefighter, I find that uh, a lot of fire stations are designed to win an award. And we want you to de- design us an award-winning fire station as well, but I prefer to win an award for functionality and not aesthetics. So how are you going to take the Chief's program, integrate it into your internal uh, development process, and ensure that we don't just end up on the cover of a fire engineering supplement and we actually get a functional fire station? Yeah, I can, I can take that one. We, it's really important to us that we design the buildings from the inside out. We don't start with an image and then design to that. Um, We really use that programming process as the foundation for the project. When we plan out a building, we want to make sure we understand every room that's supposed to be next to every other room. That drives how the plan gets laid out. That gets reinterpreted into how the building gets massed, looking at other buildings within the town, seeing what some of those design cues are, making sure that it fits within the community. But it starts with the inside of the building and how it functions. Um, and you know we'll work with Giovanna on that as well um, but that's critical uh, up front we, we, we never design from the outside in. yeah 
Yeah, those adjacencies of all the spaces, that drives everything mm -hmm. and like how those all work and where those are located. And then from there, we'll see perhaps a design opportunity. If there's a training room, does that want to be public facing? Does that want to have a little bit of a higher design? Nope, it's really internal. It wants to be super simple and just keep, so then keep it that way. Um, it's your building. We go away. Not really. No. Okay, we don't really go away. <laughs> You're kind of stuck with us. <laughs> but you know, at, at the end of the day, you have to live there. And so we want to make sure that it serves your function and not our we're as specific as when a call comes in what's the shortest route within the building for you to get to you know, get from the living space to the apparatus in the shortest amount of time we think about all of those little details as we're going through the process and, and make sure that the building functions with the processes that you are, maybe are used to using um, and and some new things like you know maybe going through a more detailed decon sequence than you've gone through in the past and how does that um, drive the design of the building and the layout so it's, it's very detailed in that matter. It, it, Giovanna does a great job of bringing you along and chief you along with showing, you know, basically bringing the materials in that are going to be inside the building. You know, we know how important the kitchen, the day room, your, your sleeping quarters are. So we're going to have all the materials laid out for you. We're going to do a furniture fair, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to bring in uh, different pieces of you know, chairs, tables, bunks that you can basically try out so you can see what you're gonna have in the building. So we try to minimize those those surprises. The kitchen, great example. We like to start with a commercial grade kitchen. If, if, if you'll have it because we know how important that is to, to your particular operation. So making sure the, the the pieces of equipment that are in there, whether it be the stove in the range, the refrigerators, uh, the countertops uh, and how you how we lay that out and, and build it on materials that are gonna last. You know, it, it's a 50 year building, right? We always say it's 50 year building. They usually end up being 100 year buildings, right? So you wanna, you wanna at least design a 50 year building that, um, that's gonna serve you well for, for a very long time. I, I know I'm gonna be guilty of sending us over, but can you just talk about how you'll make the Chiefs program the priority and, and hopefully not try to influence some, some other things oh, that you find? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I think Don mentioned early on when we go through the programming process, one of the things that I'll do is I'll show you a list of spaces that we've gone through on multiple other projects that maybe you hadn't thought of. And then you get to, you know, it's up to you to decide what goes in that building. So we're not going to try to influence one way or another. You tell us what you need in the building, and that's what we program out. We're going to help you think it through in maybe ways you hadn't thought about it before based on some of our experience. But ultimately, it's your building, and it needs to work for you. So we're going to make sure that it does. And if you say this is our program, that's what we're going to have. Yeah, that's what we'll design that's to. Right. But, but we 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 think having that that discussion, uh, we might be able to make your program that much better. Right. And healthy buildings are so important these days. So as we learn from you exactly what your day in the life is going to be, and we make sure that this building functions to accommodate your day in the life, we want to talk about well, what is the ventilation like? What is the day, natural daylight coming in here? How does it make you feel when you're in that station? You're relaxed. You're calm, you can chill out, basically, right? Um, because it's a high stress job that you have. And so our job is not only listen to you and learn from you, but to offer you these things. And say, you know, is it something you want to consider? Is it something you want to do? And we can take you to other buildings, or we can actually do 3D models, where you can see exactly, spatially, how does that room actually feel? You know, what's it gonna feel like to be in that room before we build it? the flyby that we just showed you a little snippet of from Denim. We do that on the inside too. So we, we can take you right through the building so you get a sense of what it's like in three dimensions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, have you conducted any post-occupancy uh, surveys, evaluations, fire station, public safety buildings you know, a year or two after completion? If, if so, what, what are some of the lessons? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, Bruce Dillon, who is our, he's, he's actually, he's an HVAC uh, engineer by trade, but he's also our business development person. So um, he's very good at talking to chiefs before the project comes out, and he's very good at going back to our chiefs after we've done uh, and completed our projects a year or two later. And um, it, and you know, generally we get very good good marks on on what we've done. Uh, part of the words that we had up there, the the listening, I think, is really important. 
in making sure we're hearing what you want and we put that in the building. Um, there's, you know, there's always something you can change. It's like when you move into a new house, right? There's always something you wish was a little different, but uh, there's never something that's insurmountable or, you know, we need to move this wall or, or change this particular fixture. Um, trying to think of something where we just today I got an email from Situate asking for um, we had ordered this table we'd like to order another one can you help us track track it down and so it's that like we never really go away you know it yeah. kind of hand over the keys but we're always still there yeah. and I think that that's something really nice that you know we're we're always there if you have a question or you need mm -hmm. something else like we're we're always accessible lesson learned you mentioned Situate fitness room on the second floor it's in a great spot in the building day rooms down below so we we did everything with between the structure uh and then with the with the you know gym uh, rubber floor to mitigate sound and for the most part you do but when you're in a quiet space and you hear that boom because you're dropping the weight um it's a little annoying so fitness room on the ground floor <laughs> And controls, I think, you know, heating and cooling. Yes, it's a big we one. We want to keep it simple. Yeah. You know, we want to make sure that we're not designing the most complicated thing, because they have buildings today which are completely fully automated. I can swipe my card at the front door and the building knows, okay, Ron's coming in, so we're going to turn the light on in Ron, Ron's office and we're going to do that. You know, if you want that, great, but we need to make sure that you know how to operate that. You know, and once you start getting into how we're going to operate this, you have to make a decision as a town. Are we going to need to hire a controls contractor to maintain this building for us? Um, or can we do it in such a way where it's very simple, it's programmable thermostats, almost like you have in your house, right? So that when you guys are there 24-7, 365, you can make sure you're constantly comfortable. Um, and we are not mandating what kind of control system you want. So that's another you know, lesson learned over time is you know, these things got good to a point. Then I think they went a little <laughs> overboard where many towns can't afford you know, to hire a someone from NASA to run their control <laughs> system. And, and, and we, we come in with our engineers and go through all that during design. We'll talk about different controls, we'll talk about different heating and cooling systems. You'll, you'll get to learn a lot about maybe some things you don't know about right now. Last question, if you want. You guys have introduced yourself as the team. Please confirm for us that this is going to be the team once we go from design into construction administration and construction through closeout. So we get a chance to reiterate. Hard hats and yes. yes. <laughs> these are the these are the faces you're going to see throughout the entire project. From day one to day, day whatever. One. And, and I and I will say, I'm a very active principal. Yeah. I I am at 99 percent of the meetings that I'm going to have. So you're going to have, you know, the full arsenal. And I'll be at 100% of the meetings. Well, as a follow-up to that is, how quickly are you ready to commit your team to the project? I'll see your last interview is a week from tonight, Friday morning the 14th. Is that the 14th? <laughs> 17th. 17th? I'll give you my cell phone tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks. And by the way, you'll all have my cell phone number. Um, because, and so will the contractor. You know, it's that relationship that matters. Um, Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, really, really Thank you very much. Do you, do you have any questions for us? That, that was about as thorough an interview as we've been on. <laughs> I think so. Uh, yeah. So that we really do appreciate it. They, they weren't all softballs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'd like to know, so we've obviously done our research. Um, we've taken a look at your past history. Are you willing to meet with us like this, that we get the job? Um, to meet with us and really go over everything that happened and everything that you know you're concerned about with the community and put all those things out there day one so that we are hyper focused on those things and we make sure that we're dealing with that um, and we make sure that nothing that happened before will happen again so you know I think the worst thing that can happen to a community like you is my god you learned nothing from the police station because here we are in the same situation and so if you're willing you know, to sit with us and give us all that information, we'll make sure it doesn't happen yeah. again. Love to have it. Thank Thank you. Sounds like a yes. Yes. Believe <laughs> me. Yes. yes. Everybody wants a, a different outcome. Yeah. Okay.
Terrific. May I speak? Uh, I don't think it's open meeting. Um, and we only have a couple minutes until uh, we're over. Yeah, we're over. Sorry. So, so since we came in and got to leave a, a first impression, and we know it's going to be a while before we make a decision, we left uh, some parting gifts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Pass the pie. Yeah. Don. Yeah. Hey, Don, yes. would you be able to send us a PDF of your presentation? Sure. Because of that, you know, we've got some time. It would be nice to be able to have everybody have it. So when we're talking next week, um, have it refer back to you. Just email it to me, and I'll look at it. No problem. Thank you. Kevin, like to let everybody talk. Okay. CC lets no one talk. <laughs> It's just different. It's a different approach, and both are okay. Yeah. But Thank you, you know, I think you made it. I will. I will. Thank you. 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 Thank Sorry? That public question that we have at the beginning of the meeting. He should have come early and he could have made public comment. That's what it's for. But he could come to the next one. Of course he could. Oh, yes. Everyone. Yep. He did show up the last one. He shows up all present. Well, he's busy. He eats dinner at a certain time. I don't know. He came to see me. He yeah, came yeah. with a number sure. of questions Thanks. to the select board. Have a good one. Thanks, Don. See you later. Peace through. Like this fucking school. We met like every Thursday. Well, I had a. Worked in that trailer in Boston multiple times. It's actually it's like that kind of nice time <laughs> fast. Yeah. So there you go. It's actually well, the first time I went in there. I was like, really? You know what? Oh. <laughs> I expect this to be a complete bare bone. Yeah, so for sure. Was, uh, it was a little bit of a trouble. It was really a good car after this was. Where it's not about what they got the call today. Chief. Police chief. That is. It's like a double-wide office. Good to know. Will you be out of the new one? What's that? Will you be out of the new station? I won't, no. I'll just work adjacent to it. They actually have this one. We're going to be out of 60. Right, right. So we're having that discussion. Our house is that capital of the interventions. Yeah, good. I was going to say you got to do the Hansel testing and stuff on the, the hood, but that's that's usually a fire, a fire inspector's Even thing, right? Even the residential ones, too, like the new van, also have a commercial vehicle problem. They're wise to the hood. I don't I know whenever I have a little project that's in the city and the district, that's like a big project. I was going to say that. It's a vector, it's a stricter. We still have a little fire level. I wrote down can fit new station next to old station. That was what I cared about. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm excited to work on this project. So I think there's going to be a lot of really fun upfront planning conversations. I think there's a lot of options. Uh, like the towns put themselves in a good position, and I think it, it's probably more flexibility than they're used to as design teams. So. It's like being in the, the cheap seat, cheap room in the, on the cruise ship. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's no ventilation. <laughs> like they, they can't individually climate control the rooms. Like we just have I mean, chief just talking about that. <laughs> the, the fire station window air conditioners run 365 days a year. Like it's <laughs> but but the, but the important trade offs for those kind of discussions, like we were just talking about, you know, controls for a building. Mm -hmm. You know, you can put that sheet up there and talk about efficiency. 
and that's great. But yeah. if you go super efficient and energy code, your, your set points are going to be, you know, 71, 72. Mm -hmm. You guys come back from a fire and wanted it, you, you wanted, wanted it 60. You wanted 60. Oh, yeah. you, I you want the bunker about like sweaty. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. So, that's, sweaty. so that's some of the discussion about the trade off and being realistic. Like, this group might not be able to have a lead building and be able to turn the AC down to 55. Right in those certain areas because the two things just aren't compatible. You have four and pipe the, rather than two pipe. <laughs> and the fact that they're acknowledging some of that yeah. is really great to hear because they're you know the systems are super involved and like you said you could swipe a card and mm -hmm. it's all programmed, but you don't necessarily want that. You, know? <laughs> you got to hire a yeah. building management but, system but, yeah. guy so at a hundred grand a year. Right, good. right. And then the the thing about I mean, we have a build. We have a, yeah. huge, a guy, huge Eric, yeah. and he does that, but run that around all the buildings. Layout, right. So right. your footprint may get bigger if you want to get everybody a window, mm -hmm. and that's a trade off. Right, but it's an important trade off. You know, like I'm personally against the drive through apparatus base. I just don't see them ever functioning in that manner. Like I, I worked for a department that had it like that that was really used. Right. Oh yeah. It's just added maintenance and added plowing little, and like I think you I've already given away the, uh, the the parking for the uh, commuter rail downtown good for lighting town hall for lay down good for lighting because you get the glass <laughs> over <Storage. Yeah. laughs> Cross that revenue off my list. Sorry. Huh? I think on the Bremless property down the street. Mike's saw today to say it's, they'll take 500000 Just won't give up if we're not, we're staying here. If we can. So they have a monitor, we don't need a speaker, right? Right. Exactly, I mean, yeah, well, you, you, you can move, because police sectors, it's a little easier to be where they are. The fire station, you can't. You know, you gotta be able to get. So the circle, we need to be. In that we need to be in the center of the smoke, and right now, where we are, get to everywhere. That's awesome. Like, so, yeah. we're, we don't we, we don't want to adjust that or change that. Like, because <laughs> right now, the majority is happy, we want to keep it that way. <laughs> Let's keep some kind of right? yeah, That's absolutely. Funny. And I'm sure there's added, like, I'm sure if you, if you were to go somewhere else, so there's a traffic study, there's a response study that's all just right. added. Yep, costs. Good. How is everyone? Once you're, once you're settled in a little bit, I'll, I'll kind of say a few words and we'll introduce everybody. And then, um, like John mentioned, trying to limit your initial presentation to 20 minutes. We've got some really good questions to, I think, will help you expand on everything that you have to show. Okay. Good. It will be a startling alarm. So I don't know. Just going to set it. Don't worry about it. Your trick to getting I'm, I'm going to be the guy talking at the That's end, okay. too, and I'm going to have to rattle off that last slide. Yeah, no, if, you're, if you're close, it's fine. Just finish the thought. That's no problem. You got to find, did you find the HDMI cord? We did. We did. We plugged it in, and it's not acknowledging it. Did it? It might be. Oh, you want to slide this down there? Okay. Do you want to sit in the middle? Maybe you should sit in the middle. Oh, there you go. Oh, oh yeah, behind us. <laughs> no, this is a big step. Right, right. You have to get ah, down. Okay. Down. <laughs> <laughs> This one is the. Uh, well, this, this one went to sleep too. This one is the uh, the online meeting. Yeah, the, uh, the Zoom meeting. Got our video. <laughs> Wife, our meeting, our meeting went to sleep. Our mom. So you can. Oh, you Do you want the difference? That sounds like. Matt, this one went to sleep too. Firmware update for the TV. Don't do it. <laughs> no. I'm going to hear for two no. hours. How about the new? Oh, oh no. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a different TV. Who touched it? This is different. I know, but I didn't touch this one. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. <laughs> says the guy who's holding the remote. That's what my son says all the time when yeah. it turns off, too. Yeah. I didn't get it. Time doesn't start until we get started, so don't worry. <laughs> 
just testing the clicker. Yeah, it's on us. Yes, exactly. No, I'm not hooked in. Oh, no. Who's controlling this? Can I take the clicker initially? Yeah. And then you just should be back there. Just escape. Yep. That's easy. That's easy. I feel like this is literally every mm-hmm. time I try to do a Zoom meeting in one of the cons. Like, <laughs> She's got the right one. Actually, before we get started, do a quick audio test. We have a, a video component to our presentation. Thanks, John. All right. <laughs> it works. <laughs> it works. And if you want to stand up so you're not talking to what's behind you. Oh. Yeah, we probably could stand on the side here. Yeah. Chief will be back I'll, in two I'll seconds. I'll stay seated while I man the <laughs> swapping. Actually, Kevin could probably get started. Well, sure. Chief's I think, yeah, Kevin, I think we're ready. If okay. Um, so, welcome. Um, so, the fire station uh, building committee here was was formed roughly six months ago, but really this project stretch, uh, stretches back a little further than that. It was originally packaged with the police station project um, kind of as a, a total public safety project where the police facility was going to be moved to a different part of town and then the fire station was either going to be renovated or replaced. Um, the police station project ran into some complications. We'll kind of leave it at that, that there were insufficient remaining funds to kind of continue the fire station project at that time. So now we're trying to pick it back up. We've got enough money really to get through the design phase, but not enough for construction. So um, really in part of a multi-step process here, we've got the OPM on board. The next really important piece is getting the right design team on board and then getting the community on board. So we're hoping this is the, this is the next step in that, in that correct direction. So, um, with that, I'll kind of go around the room um, to introduce everybody, and then you can you can start. So I'm Kevin Champagne, the committee chair. I'm a structural engineer by trade. Uh, Chris Baker, I'm a civil. Oh, sorry, uh, Chris Baker, uh, civil and geotech engineer by trade. Hey, John Kent, I'm an energy project manager for the state. Justin Janosik, I'm a firefighter. Uh, Aaron Hunt, I'm an architect. Blythe Robinson, I'm a town administrator. Aaron Kinney, I'm the fire chief. John Levy from Vertex OPM. Okay, thanks. And so, um, before I start, just quick question: um, Are you? Are you? I know we talked about a town meeting in the fall of next year. I'm assuming. Um, are you also considering bringing this to meeting in the spring of 2022? Or are you looking at the fall of 2020? Uh, I think once we get the the design team on on board, we'll we'll try and make that decision of the best way to approach that. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, well, I'm John Traficanti, um, the principal at Schwartz Silver, and I'll be the principal in charge of this project. Um, Schwartz Silver is, uh, is a, a local Massachusetts design firm uh, located in Boston. We're recognized nationally for our award, award-winning designs, um, and projects like this, civic buildings for towns, cities and towns in Massachusetts, really are kind of the cornerstone of our, our work and the projects we like to do. Um, we're teamed with um, Mitchell Associates, uh, Bob Mitchell. Um, Bob Mitchell's firm does pretty much exclusively works on fire station designs. Um, and we've been teaming with Bob for, for about seven years now on fire station designs. And, and recently, two of our stations, um, the Newton Station and the Walpole Station, both won national uh, design recognition. Um, Walpole won gold and Newton won silver. Um, we haven't really shared that with either of them. We don't want one to think that one design was better than the other. So, um, and then also we found out recently that uh, the Newton Station is going to be featured in the Firehouse uh, November issue. So, um, so we have had a very successful relationship with Bob, and it's um, it's become kind of a friendship where mm-hmm. we work very well as a team. Um, here today is also Kelsey Kelsey Laser. Kelsey is a registered architect for Schwartz Silver and an associate, and Kelsey will be the um, project architect. Um, Bob, as I mentioned, is our firematic uh, firematic design expert, programming, fire station um, layouts and, and planning. Excuse me, um, and then. 
Stuart Marshall. Stuart Marshall is our project manager, and I know you wanted to meet Stuart tonight. Uh, Stuart couldn't make it tonight. Um, he's, uh, he's, but he's here kind of virtually to kind of explain why he couldn't be here and what his role is going to be. Thanks, John. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Stuart Marshall. I would be your project manager from Short Silver. I'm on the handout, uh, but you're probably wondering why I'm not in the room this evening. Uh, while it looks like I'm sitting at home uh, in my home office in Salem, I'm actually on a long planned trip, uh, taking my foot on a big adventure in Alaska. Uh, at least you get to see Mass, though admittedly, uh, that may not. Uh, I have uh, 25 years of experience in public and private projects. I was the project manager for the Central Fire Station next door in Wall. In fact, uh, the whole team in front of you was involved. Uh, C and I did CA together there, and we would do the same for you. Um, I know that this team uh, here tonight can resolve your uh, current operating issues. I also know that we can deliver a fear plus building do it while being mindful of cost. Uh, we truly understand the public process, and uh, we can do it while mindful of long term firefighter safety. Uh, I wish I was there to answer questions. Uh, a great hand off, Kelsey and John, and thank you very much for your considerate. Kelsey? This way. Kelsey. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to thank you for that introduction when he gets back to the this. Um, hi, I'm Kelsey Laser. As John said, I'm an associate with Schilber. Hey, dinner. Can you use the mics when you're standing just so oh. make sure the people who might oh. be watching? Oh, this mic. Yep, there's two of them, so. Got them. You won't hear All it. All right, okay. <laughs> um, so I'm Kelsey Laser. I'm an associate with Schwartz Silver. I've been with the firm for over six years now. Um, as Stuart said, my fire station experience with him on the Walpole and also Newton Fire Headquarters in the past few years. Um, because of the way that our firm is structured, both Stuart and I um, will be on the project all the way through from concept to completion. Um, we'll both be conducting CA on a weekly basis, coming out to make sure that the construction is in line with the design intent. And I'll pass, I guess, the mic over to Bob to introduce himself. Hi. So, hi, I'm Bob Mitchell. Mitchell Associates Architects is our firm. Our sole practice is design of fire stations, has been such since 1993, when I got to do one and realized that I, that I liked it. And I liked the client, and I liked what they do. And we've done 185, 86 projects. I don't know, maybe, should we go to the next slide at this point, or, or is my off base already? Off a little bit. I'm off, okay. That's who <laughs> okay. I am. You'll learn more about me as the evening progresses. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, guys. Um, we are all, we've also assembled kind of a team of experts. Um, each we've worked with, uh, have successful working relationships with, and each is, uh, has done public safety or fire station projects. Um, uh, fire stations are really, um, and any civic building for that matter, are significant investments for towns and for the residents of the towns. And we understand that, that these are projects that um, we have to be extremely mindful of the cost and controlling the cost of these projects. Um, and we will have a, a, um, a cost estimator on board who we've worked with many times in the past and at each kind of phase he will kind of look at our drawings, keep us in line, make sure that we're meeting the budget of the town. The other thing that's really important is that this station functions the way it needs to function for the firefighters who use the building. Um, it's critical. We, every single move we make in that station can increase or decrease response time. So we know how critical the, that planning is, and that really is kind of where Bob comes in. Um, it's also important that buildings like this are built to last. 50 years at least. We, we hope our buildings last longer than 50 years. We, we actually have a fire station in Wellesley that's almost 35 years old right now. Um, and that, you know, um, you might look at our work and you might say, boy, is this the right architecture for our town? And I would actually say, 
we design every building specific to the site and the town. And the building that we would design for Norfolk is not the building we design for any other town, not the same fire station. It's going to be unique to Norfolk. And it's going to fit in with the architecture character of this town, which is a rural, rural character. So those are, the, those are some of the things that we really work hard to do. Um, we also understand the public process. So we understand how important it is to kind of bring public presentation materials from a very early start up through the process. So we can illustrate what we're working about. We used to joke, at least in my school, about talkative. Um, there's a difference between talking about architecture and actually doing it, and we feel like the presentation materials in a thorough kind of you know thorough and and transparent um, process really helps build consensus. All the groups we know are going to be involved in this process, um, the public as well, and so that's part of what we we really push hard to do. And then finally. Fire stations are specialized buildings. They are not, um, they, they are like surgical rooms. Um, so we understand that these are projects that, that need um, to be planned out as efficiently as possible. They have, they have specialized equipment, they have apparatus, all this stuff needs to fit and function in these buildings. Um, Bob's experience and Bob's kind of understanding of this really is unparalleled. He, he, he's going to talk for a few minutes now, but I have to tell you, it's, it's, um, we've done fire stations without him and we've done fire stations with him. And the fire stations that we plan with him start out at an unbelievable level of detail. Like the plans, um, I probably already went past this, but the plans that he will present at a conceptual level will have all the equipment laid out in the plans. So we understand that the room's big enough to fit the stuff. It's not just a number on a sheet. It's actually a plan with the equipment in it. So how is that for an introduction? <laughs> All right. So, so thank you. Uh, so our firm, uh, roughly half of our work on any given year is projects that we take from beginning to completion under, our, under my license. And the other half is work where we work with people like Schwartz Silver as a consultant to provide to ensure that the building is firematically correct. And we've been doing this for quite a while. As you can see, we've done many, 180 plus projects. Uh, I'd like to point out that a, a bunch of what we do is renovation. I've been doing renovations since 1969. That was my first project. And uh, and in, well, let's stay, stay back there for a minute. I'll come back to that. And, and the work that we do is, you know, we're very active in the community. And we, I lecture at the Firehouse Station Design Conference. I lecture at Fierro. And this year I'm going to be lecturing at the Fierro PPE Conference, which is solely for scientists, except there's one architect presenting. And the subject of my presentation is how do you design a proper decon laundry? All of these scientists from NIOSH and NIST and the Illinois Fire Institute, they understand the chemistry of, of what needs to be done. And they're, we're looking for a dialogue about what is the best way for this to happen in a fire station. You know, there are often false starts on what should be in a fire station with regard to health. You may remember five, six years ago, there was a big push for saunas with exercise bikes in them. And you know, there's a problem with that because they increase the risk of a heart attack. And when you're exposed to these toxins, your viscosity blood goes up, you don't want to be exercising inside a sauna under those conditions. I believe that our involvement with these organizations gives us a level of understanding that is unique. We, if you'll see here on this, uh, the, um, your old fire station, should you renovate it or knock it down? That's the other lecture I do at these conferences. And the IAFC's design manual, I wrote the chapter in it on renovation addition. I know that renovation addition is an option, and we will make a rational decision to help, or not to say we will help you make a rational decision about how to keep. You know, you have a bunch of embedded carbon in that structure. You have money value in that structure. Will it work for your best interest or will it not? We do a lot of that. Um, it starts with programming. I firmly believe programming is the most important part of the project. Everything that's going to happen is defined in programming. 
we will spend mm, upwards of 30 hours in FaceTime talking. I'll spend, I spend on average 65 hours in this step of the project. And each room is described in that level of detail that you see. And we address issues, as you see on this list on the left, how to separate hot and cold zones, how to limit the exposure to carcinogens in the building, what are the basic tenets of how you're going to organize the building to do that, how to provide proper sleeping accommodations. It's a big issue, sleep deprivation. You know, we did a prototype station for Philadelphia. They ran 20,000 calls a year out of that building. Nobody slept anyway. You know, that's one every 30 minutes. But that's not what you have. And we have to figure out how to make it possible for people to actually sleep in between the stresses of calls. Issues that have to do with the stress and the emotional heightened events that happen, that the station can either be a place where somebody is told, suck it up, get ready for the next one, or it could be a place that acknowledges that it's stressful work. And we can do things in the design based on your buy-in of those things to accommodate that. And gender equality is an issue that we have to address, ADA, all of these things matter in these buildings. At the end of programming, you'll have a diagram at this level of each space in the building. The one on the right happens to be the decon laundry area from Southbridge, and it represents our beliefs and part of what I lecture about, about how the process of decontamination is a process, as if you were making a widget. The one on the left is the EMS facility for Hyannis, where they have a very high volume of medical calls. We will know at the end of programming what you need, we, and the rooms will be defined in a way that when the building is built, you'll be familiar with the room. The room in the building will be that room. It might be stretched a little this way and that, but it will be functionally and recognizably what was agreed to in the earliest stage of the design process. All of the things that are systems within the building have to be looked at from the point of view of your men and the intention that we have to support firefighter health and safety. Separation of hot and cold zones isn't just a matter of having a diaphragm that separates the space. It's a matter of controlling the barometric pressure between the spaces so we don't have the byproducts of combustion. Okay, fire trucks come back plated out with polyaromatic cyclo, well, sorry, polyaromatic hydrocarbon particles, soot, that evaporate into the stream in the bay. We allow that to move into the living space. So, ergo, we have to have higher pressure in the living space in the, than in the bay, even under conditions when the bay doors are opening into a prevailing wind and the pressure is attempting to jump. It requires proper detailing, it requires proper mechanical systems. Uh, we will look at all these other things that you see on this list here. Um, and I don't want to say more now because we're going to run out of 20 minutes. But <laughs> we can turn to them. Like, like life cycle chromic MEP systems are really important. To. And the idea that we could also um, create a building that, if we can't do net zero, it can be net zero ready. It can be an all electric thing that can take electric on top. And so, thank you. Thank, well, thank you. That's how I am. Just tip, yes. of the, tip of the iceberg there. <laughs> Um, so as a team, we definitely understand the need for kind of a comprehensive and thorough approach to this feasibility study so that you as the town and the fire department can pick the option that is best for you, whether that's addition, renovation, or a new construction. Um, that process for us, which is something that we've started and we'll show you a couple schemes that we've started to explore um, at a very early stage, kind of just based off what we know from the RFQ and some of Bob's preliminary programming assumptions. Um, and it, these concepts have, have taken into to consideration all of these elements, um, including programming that, that Bob alluded to, or, but also site context, um, existing structures, on-site operations, um, vehicle exiting and um, accommodation for future growth of the department, the health, safety, and well-being of the firefighters, and a sustainability that's also efficient and effective. Um, so uh, just to kind of help you guys orient you and get your bearings, um, the fire department site is in yellow. North is actually down on this aerial map, and Main Street is running uh, right below the fire station. 
Uh, we started off our investigations uh, looking at the context, uh, noting that the fire department kind of anchors this central civic zone in the town, but also the property abuts commercial, residential, and undeveloped woodland. Uh, we took note of the other civic buildings in this area that are important, the church that's nearest the site, the uh, library, and the town hall where we are now. Um, and then we developed our understanding of the existing conditions on the current <coughs> site, um, including the property boundary, uh, zoning setbacks, and the existing structures, which of course the uh, apparatus bay and the admin offices, which are the original construction plus the 1985 addition with all of those mothballed police department spaces and the accessory structures on the site. Um, so those are those buildings shown here in a three-dimensional virtual model that we've used um, kind of to demonstrate our initial thinking about the study. Um, I, think, I think too the purpose for kind of doing this is just to illustrate a little bit how we would start the process with you. Um, we understand this is a this we're doing a lot of this without any conversation that would not happen but we wanted to kind of illustrate the process that we would take trying to understand the site understand some of the possibilities and then really looking at pros and cons for these options which would then end up in a matrix so we can present it at the end and say this is the best option because we looked at all these other options and we've got a we've got proof that this satisfies the needs better than all those other options well, well said, John. Um, so this first option that we're showing is a renovation and addition, just to help key you in with the color coding. The gold is, indicates temporary operations during construction, the, the existing structures to remain, and the darker red it would be the new addition um, in this scheme. We are proposing um, renovating the existing structure with building a new apparatus bay on the right based on our understanding from the walkthrough. The existing apparatus bay is just too narrow and too short, I think, to, to feasibly be renovated for the primary apparatus structures. Um, in this scheme, you would need a temporary operations for admin rental that we're showing here in this kind of additional gold block, um, because obviously you can't occupy the existing building while they're renovating it. Um, and what that would look like um, after construction is um, amassing kind of similar to this. Also, please note that um, this is really just intended to show kind of general scale and massing and not necessarily indicative of final proposed roof structures or, or shapes or anything like that. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to the pros. Yeah, I, I think quickly there are pros and cons for each of these and I want to be conscious of our time too. And we can always come back to these and look at them in the end uh, if there are questions about these specifics. So I'm going to... Yeah, sure. Um, we also, for each of these options, wanted to know opportunities for expansion in the future. Um, in this particular scheme, you could develop down the road um, in the space where the existing apparatus bay is. Resetting us for the, the second scheme, which it would be a new construction on the vacant adjacent lot. Nope. Keep going. <laughs> sure. It's your 20. Um, go quickly. Um, you could operate during construction out of the existing structure as is with no additional requirements. This does have some setbacks, primarily the orientation um, due to the smaller nature of this extra site of the apparatus exit and entrance, um, which does limit your kind of future expansion opportunities as well. Um, and then the third, resetting again for the third and final scheme um, would be a new construction on the current site. There's a few ways you could do this, either 100% demolition of the existing building, which would require a much more robust temporary operations rental setup, um, or what we're showing here is a partial phase demolition where you would demo the admin wing, again, needing a, a temporary layer, and then construct um, a new building, kind of mostly on the footprint, but again, extending to the right side of the structure for the apparatus bay um, and then the final construction would be something situated like this a little bit more optimally on the site um, with kind of the best feasibility that we're understanding for for future expansion because you can add on on either side um, and, and, so, and so I kind of ended here um, we're, we're really um, you know why Schwartz Silver and Mitchell because you know we have both public building and fire station design and and plenty of it um, and that we understand how important proper programming and space planning is to the project 
we're a collaborative bunch of folks. We enjoy conversation, we enjoy exploring design ideas, and we won't do a cookie cutter building for you. We will not do something that, that is just kind of off the shelf. Um, and our personal commitment project. So we, we, have, we would make this a priority as we do all of these projects in our office. So thank you, and I'm sorry for running a few minutes no, over. That's, that's okay. okay. It's okay. Yeah. I know 20 minutes is difficult to, to get through everything, but like I said, I promise. I think some of our questions will kind of help allow you to expand on kind of what you've been showing. Okay. So. Um, you guys might want to sit for this part. <laughs> 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 the questions were that tough. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Take it in now. <laughs> so uh, if you can kind of maybe walk me through or describe the, the construction bid process and, and your role as well as you know what the town's role would be yes there, there are a couple of options for for a bid process so you can either do a, a typical chapter 149a which is kind of design bid build the process um, or you could do uh, chapter 149a did I say a the first time too <laughs> chapter 149 and Chapter 149A, which would be a CM at risk process, um, and the, you know, we've done them both ways. I think that you might choose a CM at risk process only if you're renovating and there are a lot of unknowns uh, with the construction process. Um, if it is a typical, if it's a new building or demolition and it's straightforward, um, I think I would uh, recommend that you do a simple design bid build process. Um, our role, um, well, Kelsey has been kind of working in that role a lot uh, recently, but our role during construction is um, we're very involved during construction. We're at, every, we're at weekly meetings uh, with the contractors. We know a lot of the Massachusetts G GCs um, have, worked, have good working relationships with a lot of them. Um, and our, our role is a, is a pretty thorough role during construction. During the bid process, we would assist you in, in the documentation, answering any questions that the contractors might have, uh, making sure the other part of a, a design bid build uh, project, Chapter 149A is, or Chapter 149, sorry again, um, is that uh, the sub-bid process. And um, it's really important to make sure that the sub-bids um, are noted properly, not only in the spec, but we've gotten in the habit of putting it right on the drawings. So there's a clear reference between the drawings and the spec. So if it's a missed metal item, it's going to be on the drawings so they don't miss it. I mean, the biggest problem with that process in Massachusetts is the sub-bid process, in, in kind of my opinion. You know, it's a lot of things can get missed. So we, we work really hard. Robert Silver writes our specs. Robert Silver has been doing this for, um, well, the firm's been in business for over 40 years, so he's been doing it at least that long. Um, so uh, that's a process that we, we take great pride in. I'd like to add something to that, too. When it comes to all the Firematic hardware, and the things as simple as the brand of overhead door, the type of operator for it, we we join in the process very carefully analyzing what substitutions are being proposed and and we have some experience I've, I think that we've been involved with 27 or 28 Massachusetts fire station projects so we understand the difficulties in Massachusetts of trying to assure that the preferred piece of equipment ends up in the building and we will work with you on strategies to make sure that happens and also strategies to select which are the owner purchased items like if you're replacing your CBA fill equipment or any of those items um, but but there are really some considerations with something that might seem as trivial as the overhead door operator that the need to be followed system. yeah or, or the, yeah the tailpipe exhaust I mean there are items that are not three products available so we have to help you deal with the requirements under Massachusetts law for that instance. Okay, thank you. Um, so next question that I have is um, maybe you can walk us through an example project, doesn't have to, recent project or not necessarily recent, but where a latent condition was discovered uh, during construction that resulted in unexpected cost and how you mitigated it. I, I can talk about one right now. You want to talk about one? Yeah, we're working on a project in Putnam Valley, New York, where in spite of all the borings 
there was a, there was granite that was not revealed by the borings, and the uh, the because of the planning board, there would be a six month delay if they wanted to do blasting. So they started pounding it, and they were getting nowhere. And it was going to look like it was going to be two hundred thousand dollars worth of pounding work before they got maybe where they needed to get. So we redesigned the foundation system and the site plan to get the bottom of the footing over the main part of the building two feet up and on the retaining wall, because it was tucked in a hillside, two foot nine inches up, it brought the pounding to a, a much smaller amount. Is that the kind of example you think? Yeah, is? yeah. No, okay. I think that's good. And I don't know if that, if my next question is related to, you know, resolving conflicts with the, the contractor, giving an example. I, I don't know if that resulted in a conflict with the contractor, you have a different example. Well, we're not done talking to them, or they with us, because they're <laughs> going to come back with a winter conditions claim because it's delaying the movement of the work. And we're going to be having conversations with them about their delays in getting their submittals in. So we know how to you know, talk turkey and let's make a deal, because it always comes down to that. Right. But it is, um, it's in, a re in renovation projects, there, there's always something that comes up, and we do a lot of renovation, and we We've seen a lot. I mean, I, I'm thinking of even just the Newton fire station where um, we discovered um, additional hazard asbestos in some of the, um, <coughs> the wall in the uh, wall waterproofing, which we had done a, um, a hazmat report. They missed it, but we discovered it early. It was actually something Robert Silver had said. Did anyone check that waterproofing? And so. We were able to discover it before we actually had the contractor on board, I believe is kind of what, how, what happened. So we were able to mitigate and at least kind of alert them to that as part of the process, so, or part of their cost. So those are, but you know, I, I, I will say that there, it's challenging as, as all you professionals in the business kind of know to catch everything. I think the more experience that you have working with, with renovations and existing building conditions, the more likely you are to look in the right place before. I mean, that's what you really want to happen because it's never a good situation where you have to, there's gonna be delay claims and everything else. And those are hard things to kind of work out. They always result in the owner paying more money. I mean, part of the process is to make sure there's a contingency available for those things if it goes to a, a, as a renovation. I'd like to also say that in my own experience, prior to 93 when I started doing fire stations, I had done design build of 60 or 70 buildings, at least half of which were renovations. So I have the, what you learn from the mistake you make on your way to learning what you learn. And in the fire station that was a renovation, the contractor defaulted at about 6% complete, and we took over as construction workers and did the building. And that's one of the bills that was on that list of award-winning buildings. And uh, I'm not volunteering to do that. <laughs> but, I but, was, but we have the height, we have height and understanding. I mean, my own house, when we bought it, had never had plumbing, heating, or electricity. It was built in 1805. I'm used to this. I like this. I mean, you get, anyway. It, I'm too old to start another one. <laughs> but we can bring the wisdom to the, uh, or I don't want to call it wisdom, the experience and the insight and the ability to see. You know, that you look at buildings differently when you're used to tearing them apart. And, uh, uh, and period buildings, too. Working with certain periods, you always see the same things. It was just the type of construction. So, so we, we, we're quite sure that that's unreinforced block over at the station and there are probably all kinds of associated issues with with that building because of the time it was built thank you so in a fire station you know obviously lots of different diff different systems um, public address security station alerting um, lots of different items in your view who designs them who procures them and who ultimately owns coordination of those? Um, this is, that's a great question. Um, and we <laughs> run into this in every single project. 
And Bob, I'm sure you've got a very good answer for this. No, I don't. Um, <laughs> actually, I actually do not have a good answer. Yeah. It's in particular with the alerting system, because it's they're proprietary. And it's going to be up to the chief and the people who are living in the building to determine which alerting system meets their needs. And we've done comparative tables of the different products that are available, and then distance from here to the nearest person who takes care of them. Um, I believe, with regard to the alerting system, that it should be a direct contract to the owner. And that might be the wrong answer, but that's what I believe because of what I just described about it. As far as the other systems you talked about, I think that the electrical engineer on the team is is the point contact for that, for the coordination of it. Um, you know, our documents need to address it, for sure. On bid day, you need to know what's, what's out there. We, we put a lot of time into looking at what other people, well, what's generally referred to as soft costs. But for us, a bunch of that is the firematic equipment, which could easily be $400,000 worth of stuff. You know, a breathing air apparatus device is $50,000. A washer extractor can be $22,000. You get a bunch of these things adding up quickly. And um, so we learned early that you better have that stuff carefully identified. We start, in pro at the end of programming, we make a very preliminary list of all that stuff. And all during the design process, it gets refined and refined and refined. And by the time construction documents go out, each room that has this kind of equipment in it has a larger scale floor plan with everything tagged, interior elevations, everything's tagged, same numbering system, back to a spreadsheet, all the equipment, who buys it, who wants to what size power does it take, what size piping does it get, blah, blah, all that stuff, so that all the engineers are not caught short. Because these, a uh, 60-pound uh, extractor gives up two gallons of water in 45 seconds when it starts to act. You, that's not going to just go down the pipe. You have to plan that. And there's a lot of coordination that's going to take place in just the um, that equipment and the loads of all those equipments electrically, um, which will then play into the loads of the generator. How do we size the generator? You need to size the generator to run all this equipment. So all of that stuff is is a is a real challenge uh, co coordinating it all. Um, but we have done this before. Um, and and I think you're right. I think a lot of that, um, it, the electrical engineer is the lead for a lot of those systems. Um, and, um, you know, but for the alerting system, I think at Walpole, that was an owner uh, situation. Yeah, and we'll be in the conversation because yeah. we, we've seen them all. I'll tell you the thing that's really emerging. Uh, what's going to happen when you have an electric fire truck? <laughs> what, how do we plan the power supply for that? <laughs> How do we, how do, what do we do about having things as combustible as lithium ion batteries inside a fire station? These are things we have to talk about, and we don't have answers to this yet, because it's, it's just emerging. But we have to take a best shot at figuring it out. I like that electric fire trucks. It's good, it's <laughs> We're talking about that today. Yeah. They, already, they already have some in California. Nice. So just to, so basically you're, you, know, you own the coordination. Okay. Oh. Great, good, good. <laughs> want to add be specific? To no, 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 no. Just, <laughs> just confirm it. Um, and then this is a follow-up. I mean, obviously, it's been alluded to and spoke to a little bit the past experiences of the town, but town expects full design services. Is there, is there anything that you see yourself excluding in your scope of services? Is there anything that you know? And if so, why? Um. No, you know, we're, we're, we typically will include everything. I, the only thing that I can imagine would be, um, would be addition, would be um, special presentations or meetings. Um, if you wanted us to present to town meeting, I would imagine that's an additional service. I would think that any, any, um, any, any, you know, extraordinary renderings, things we can't do in-house that we would have to pay someone else to do, could be viewed as additional um, uh, additional cost. Um, but really, we're we're a full service firm. Um, we we don't look for additional services, probably as much as we should. 
Um, but you know, we just don't. We think that it's it's important to the relationship that we'll have is Im more important than nickeling diming. You know, for a, a couple of renderings or a, additional service. I think if we ask for something, it'll be pretty clear that it's an obvious ask. I really do. It's just how we don't. We run. Our, that's how we run our firm. Great. Thank you. Well, furniture FFE the equipment would be included. Um, but that would be part of our that would be part of our um, overall proposal with the town to include bunking, um, typical yeah, FF and E. I, no, I, mean, I, think, I think the basics of the question is more along the lines of we don't do hazmat consulting because our insurance company doesn't allow it. Well, we don't want to be in the business of having the town be the, you know, we want to know that whether it's a base service or an ad service. Are there any services that you just won't provide? Well, yes. Has the hazmat hazmat um, survey would typically be something. Um, if we're asked to provide it, we can we can contract with someone to do to do that survey. But we need to know that before we sign a contract. Um, as something that is outside of what is typically AIA scope. Sure. Right. And and that includes other things okay. like surveys. Excuse me. Ge the geotech boring. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. testing services during construction would be outside of our scope typically. Okay. Great. That's exactly what I was driving towards. Thank okay. you. Sorry. No, no, no problem. No, that's great. So one of the things that I worry about amongst lots of things as town administrator is, is the money and making sure that, that if we we're planning for something, we're telling the residents it's going to cost something that that's what it costs or yeah. costs less ideally. Um, so a concern I have is is how do you and your sub consultants go, what processes do you use to make sure that when those plans and specs for construction are done, that they're not missing the, the plug for the, the whatever in a room um, or things that are gonna end up in construction change orders because someone missed them and didn't coordinate as we were just talking about. How do we do that? Um, that that's again. These are all very good questions. So that again is a very promised. good question. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, internally, we have a process for QA and QC, and that is uh, directed by Robert Silver. Again, he writes the spec, and he will review all the drawings internally. And the reason that he does it is because he wants to make sure that if it's on the drawings, I've got it in my spec and vice versa. If it's in the spec, it's coordinated with the drawings. In terms of the engineering, that responsibility falls on Stuart, Marshall, primarily, and I would then review it as well. Um, if what we found in some projects where the systems are very complicated, potentially like this project, is that it sometimes pays to have an outside consultant review the mechanical systems. And, um, and that's something we can talk about, whether, whether it's important enough to do that. Um, we, see, we see some advantage in doing that because outside eyes on some of this stuff is worth doing. It picks up, oftentimes we'll pick up some things. So if that's something that is of interest, we can absolutely include that outside. Not spending more. No, understood, <laughs> understood. Um, I think additionally, a process that we use is um, continuous estimating throughout the CD process to make sure that we're tracking on budget. So that means at 60% construction documents, we're getting an estimate, and then again at 90 or 95, so that before we complete it and it goes out to bid, we're making sure that we're still tracking on budget and there's time to either pull things out as add alternates or deduct alternates um, to make sure that when the bids come in, that they are coming in on budget, um, and it didn't, part of the budgeting is also, I think, um, uh, accounting for contingency funds for those unforeseen conditions are, are ultimately just inevitable, I think, especially with a renovation. Well, I can talk to my own experience. Uh, the last six jobs that we have done, change orders related to what you're talking about, not ownerages, has never exceeded one third of one percent. So, and that, what they're describing is this what we do internally. And another piece to it, all we do is fire stations. We don't look in the drawing set. It's, uh, if I did a library for you, I'd make a mess of it. 
library architect might make a mess of a fire station. So, and I'm happy to be a one-trick pony. You know, it's uh, it's good to be good at something. Thank you. All right. Uh, a major concern uh, for the fire department staff is their living quarters. Currently, the staff inhabit a mobile home, which has become undersized as the department has grown over the years. What is your firm's approach to tackling temporary quarters relocating oper and relocating operations? How would you make this matter a priority, and how do you provide a cost-benefit analysis of the different options? You want to talk to the temporary option? I, I want to say some things about the ultimate final living space. Yeah, we um, we saw the the bunking situation you have, and um, I I. It's it's terrible. It's it's honestly the the temporary bunking that we've done for other stations during construction is actually nicer than what you have is permanent bunking. And um, so, uh, in terms of in terms of kind of um, the cost of temporary operations, you know, I, I think we talked a little on site about you know some of those costs. They can be they can be quite large. So, you know, they, I, I can give you a couple examples. Walpole, because it was their central station, they needed, they needed a four bay tent. And how many bunks did we have in there? Six or seven bunk rooms? I think it, it was an open space for kind of the yeah. yeah, I think it was six, but six, six, or, six or eight. Six or eight, yeah. Um, but that was a very expensive thing to do. It cost the town, I think, over 600,000 just for the temporary pieces of a you know the the tent and the bunking and then that didn't cost that didn't include the cost to um, take it down re-landscape the area that they put it on and to heat the thing um, all winter long um, so you know I think we would like to explore with you options where you where you can avoid some of those costs so those costs go into a, a, a final station that they're not thrown out the window is is just operating costs and I think you actually have a pretty good situation. You have enough land and enough site to avoid a lot of those temporary operations costs. Um, so I, I would say that would be what we would we would look for in terms of improving the firefighter bunking situation, even during that period. Um, boy, if 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 you can do it. I would say yes, and um, that might mean bringing in a temporary trailer and converting the trailer you have for more admin services or something. Give the firefighters a better situation during construction. You know, that might be an option. Did, did you also have questions about what the ultimate living space might be like? Um, not, I mean, not okay. the not the in game. No, I think our my priority and our priority as a staff is is looking at what is an overburdened situation that um, is, you know, it is, a, is an issue, it's a, it's a problem where we're trying to get, get it addressed um, and work through it to make sure it fits within the scheme of and the process of, of getting the final product done. I think we all understand or know that a product project is going to be, you know, sufficient and meet the needs. You know. And obviously there'll be a lot of questions and things we discuss leading that but I think you know right now this question is just trying to address the the temporary housing situation which right now is is a tough one. Um, please describe your firm's approach to construction administration uh, what are your practices when it comes to keeping projects running smoothly um, such as verifying adherence to construction documents responding to RFIs and then on-site supervision and inspections and things. Um, sure, so I will be part of the tag teaming it along with Stuart where um, similar to how we handled Walpole, both of us will be coming to the weekly uh, AOC site meetings where we'll run through with the contractor. Usually, um, I think the Vertex, the OPM would kind of set the agenda for those meetings, but typically you're running through um, you know, the contract things, but also adhering to um, kind of what came out of the latest field report from the previous week and how is the contractor going to address those, um, talking through any change requests or, or supplemental instructions or RFIs that need to get answered. Um, 
it's something that definitely because we're so close by that we're able to kind of the Schwartz Silver team is able to be there on a weekly basis. And I know Bob's team. Um, we don't, we'll come as frequently as we're needed. As is needed. Because we're, we're, we're not going to be looking at how, if the footings are being done right. We're going to be looking at are they making sure that there are not, let's say, for instance, conduits on the wall in the bay when they should be in the block in order for us to keep a sanitary bay? And we have a real issue about that. Uh, are, are, is, the, is the mortaring perfectly flat in the bay so we could end up with a, we're also talking about a, a much smoother block than you might expect so we can get a surface that is easy to keep sanitary all the things that would affect the ability to have a cove all there's there's a you go down this whole long list of items like that we in my lecture about decon laundry i show some pictures of buildings where the failure to control those things has turned these places into rats nests of surface mounted stuff that makes it impossible to consider it a decontamination place because you can never clean it so we're going to be, our nose is going to be right inside of that. The, the design will have a bunch of integrated training features. This is something we're very big on. The, if you get the new FEMA fire station design manual of our projects is on the cover. And four of our projects that are specifically around integrated training are, are, are used as illustrations in the book. And we'll make sure things don't get screwed up like there's a bailout window where you're going to rappel down did somebody certainly put a thermostat there or whatever those things are to make sure that everything works correctly clearances around confined space explication notes so we come and look at that stuff um, we participate in submittal review on related matters and uh, help them make sure that long lead items that we know about are not going to get backed up and have the con telling you, well, you can't really have the thing you want, it's gonna delay the project. Yeah, I think I was gonna say um, something along those lines, which is is a, a, a successful uh, construction really has to do with good communication um, or in construction with the contractor, and it really has to do with staying on top of those submittals so that they aren't piling them on us at the end and expecting us to turn everything around week. So. Um, we we work really hard to get those out the door. Kelsey is um, just unbelievable how how efficient he is in reviewing these things. But it really is about a good communication with the contractor, understanding, you know, what's coming up next. What do I need to pre prepare for? The steel package is always a big one, you know, um, and those are things that can delay projects. Windows and doors, these days are serious problems. You need to get those uh, reviewed right away because the lead times on some of that stuff is crazy right now. Yeah. Um, hopefully when you guys build it, we'll, the, the adjustment will be back and we won't be going through this, this yeah. the times we're going through. But, but right now, it's, it's coordination is key to getting so there aren't delays. And as soon as you delay a project, it turns into money. So we work, you know, we will need to work with the contractor and you know, as a team um, to make sure that doesn't happen, that delays don't happen because of review. Yeah, there's a, there's a thin line between helping them and badgering them. Because they, they, you know, we, the computer keeps track of the status of submittals and what should have been here and what's delayed and all that stuff. And they, they have their own complications in their lives and they're not very good typically at getting everything out. And we have to be paying attention to what are the long lead items like John was talking about. We have a project in Brunswick, Maine, where I don't know if you're aware of the kind of delays in steel right now, but they had uh, foundations done and sitting for three months waiting for steel. And winter's coming in Maine. And nobody planned on that. Now the owner doesn't own that problem. It's not an act of God. The contractor owns it. So, but to the extent that we can help nudge them, we do. Because it's, it's it becomes a problem for everybody. Because the worse, the, the more the things out of alignment later in the project, the more the contractor's angry, and trying to catch up, and trying to short things to minimize their losses. And 
the more we're aggravated and you're aggravated. So if we can nudge them along, it's good for everybody. I also just wanted to chime in that in addition to our teams here, Mitchell Associates and Schwartz Silver, we have a lot of confidence in our consultants, um, our MEP and structural engineers and, and landscape and, and the rest of them and our contracts with them as our sub consultants will account for them to provide ample site visits and, and the rest of the CA process as well. Just a quick heads up, we've got about 10 left and we've got about four questions. One of, one of them's really short, just to, again, we're not gonna cut you off, but we're just gonna keep, well, we wanna keep you close, all right? I'll take that as a cue to get on to the next question. <laughs> uh, so uh, you've heard a couple <coughs> times tonight, there's some history in town with the police station and over budget and took longer than everybody wanted and there's been lots of talk around town about you know not doing it again why it happened we will encounter those conversations again as we get into our presentations with the town for this project uh, they were tied together in the beginning they're tied together now um wondering if if your team has any you know aces up your sleeve in terms of you know communicating with the public about difficult situations or maybe a, a story from another, a past project where you successfully negotiated you know, a touchy situation or you know, just any, any way you might go about tackling what is going to be a situation we have to explain as we go forward here on this project. Yeah, I, um, uh, let me take a quick crack at that. And you know, I, um, I think the, the best way to tackle situations like that is, is to kind of use examples of successful projects that you've done. Um, um, our last two public projects have both come in under budget, um, significantly under budget. Um, Metro was two million under budget. How much? Seven million under budget? It was an anomaly. <laughs> that was. A, that, that was. I promise that for, for you. Don't go there. No. <laughs> um, it's being recorded. It down. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and um, so it really is to use examples of successful projects is kind of a good way to 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 counter someone question can you do this we are very good at keeping schedules so if we say we're going to get something done we're going to get it done we're we're not the firm that says we're going to get it done and then ask for a week or two to extend the deadline um, because all that stuff always kind of piles and adds up so um, as an example to to these pro you know to counter the questions and and by the way I chair a design review board in my town and I I'm very familiar with the process of design coming in and them coming back and saying, well, we can't afford this, we've cut this back. And it's a, it's a frustrating process for people of a town who have certain expectations and then are let down because they can't deliver because of the cost. We are aware of that. And as Kelsey said, I think the process of coordination early on and keeping our team in line and everybody up at the same level and having it estimated at every single interval. So it, at the end of schematic design, at the end of conceptual design, we should be getting an estimate. We should understand, are we in the ballpark right away? I mean, um, schematic design, estimate, DD, part 60% CDs at least. You know, these are all places where I would expect that we would at least have a check-in with PM and C. You know, Peter Bradley's a, a fantastic estimator. He's, he's quick, he understands this stuff. So um, I, I think we have a team that can, can do our best to, to not let you down like what happened um, on your last project. And we have a, we have a very good track record of that. It, it, was there another part to this about communicating this to the community? Was that part of what you were asking about or uh, not? I, I guess, yeah. I mean, the question, I mean, ultimately, there's this project history that we can't dodge. We're going to have to address it. The questions are going to come up in public meetings. Um, and we're going to have to own it as a team. And yeah. uh, just uh, your thoughts on how we might go about owning up to that and saying we've got it under control and, and don't worry about it. Start early, communicating, yeah, and just keep communicating. I mean, we've... I, guessing that 50 or 60 of our projects went through some sort of referendum and it, earlier in our career we used to be the basically the marketing consultant too because I was one of these guys so we could do everything and uh, so we have practice 
and um, we can help you make sure that the message is defined and then I think you're, you're going to want somebody independent of us hired to help you talk to the community because it's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of moving parts here and it, whatever it is you know there's nothing I have there's not a single building that I've been involved with even a six hundred thousand dollar fire station that wasn't accused of being a Taj Mahal <laughs> and you hear horrendous things at public hearings what do they need bunk rooms for they can sleep on the floor you hear the people saying things like that and why are they going to have a nicer room than I have talking about the living space so so there's people who are going to be like that and you know the body politic has gotten more that way and you know so you have to be ahead of all that with the message and uh, we have experience to help you sort of know maybe how it might play but you, you should have somebody that you hire who is that's their mission and we will happily work with them to help get the message out there. I, I think the other thing is, uh, I don't know if you had an OPM on that project, um, but I, I know that these guys are, are really great at establishing a budget and expectations up front that, that are realistic. I think sometimes I've seen projects go forward where the goals are just not realistic. The, the budget isn't realistic, the square footages aren't realistic, I think that's part of it. It has to be, and then you go to the town. Once you understand what's, what is a realistic building and what that thing should cost, we'll go to the town and we can, we can design a building to that budget. But if it doesn't start out as being realistic and um, for one reason or another, um, then it's really difficult to not let people down. And what you don't want to do is that. You want to present something that is a is a project that can be built for what you say it can be built in the time frame you say it can be built and if you do that then people will less question about is it a Taj Mahal because you've established a budget and you're keeping to that budget well that's a good transition to the next question um, <clears throat> I, I appreciate your award-winning experience and we certainly want you to design us an award-winning firehouse but from my experience as someone that uses firehouses Oftentimes, what is wins awards aesthetically and gets on the covers of Firehouse Fire Engineering is not remotely functional. So, how I would prefer us to win an award for functionality and not for uh, right. outward aesthetics. What? So, how, let me. I, I get that. <laughs> he gets that, and we get that, and that's why we're making the Yeah, I must say, I must say, I, because nope. we we are we 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 went into this profession to design great buildings okay but a great building isn't a great building if it doesn't function and we realized early on that this is an extremely specialized building type and we can't we can't do it as successfully as we can with with Bob on board you know I've, I've won awards from fire chief as early as 2003 and so and and every year in some sort of from those people I see they give the gold prizes to and sometimes I go like this, you know, it's, it's all about the kitchen with the Florida glass looking out on the Rocky Mountains and stuff like that. You saw the diagrams I had of the floor plans of the decon laundry and, and the EMS storage room. That's what's important in the design of the building. It's great if you combine it with a really terrific exterior. So, you know, the, the Peekskill Fire Station, they call that the new gateway to the city. That's, that gives me a lot of pride that they feel that way about it. But what matters is that we've had the discussion that says, when you come in and you've got a dirty mask, where do you, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to handle it? How are you going to get everything clean and back into service quickly? What are you going to do in the meantime if you're short on part A because it's out of service or what? I'm a nuts and bolts guy. I, I, I used to rebuild cars all the way, engine, transmission, the whole thing. This is a machine for you to work in, and it has to be designed that way. So that is, and believe me, that's first and foremost. It's great if it's a beautiful building. I think I may be guilty of us going over, but I, uh, I think that the chief's program is important. How do we make the program the priority and not 
add up too many outside influences into that. Um, uh, By working with the chief? Yeah, I, I have to say, I think that the process that, uh, maybe you should talk just, uh, just briefly on kind of the programming process, because um, we're all involved in this process early on. And I, I've done this with Bob now for, for the last, for, for seven years, for, for, you know, for a number of different types of fire stations renovations that new you know um, but it's an intense process where we look at every single room we look at every adjacency we look at all the equipment in the rooms what's going to happen when when I'm I'm in my bunk room and the alarm goes off what's my pound to the to the station where yeah. where's the apparatus where's where, where's the turnout gear located you know all that stuff becomes part of that process so, so I can provide you testimonials from other fire chiefs about that process because they invariably at the end of the process say, I had no idea we were going to get this deep into this. Because it, you have to. You don't get a second shot at it. You, know, you don't want to walk in the building and say, where is this? Where is that? I, we always have this joke about, about the yard sale with all the things we didn't plan for and you move in, they're all in the heap in the middle of one of the bays. You know, everything has to be thought about. And that's what drives it. Not some, you know, will I bring to the conversation my personal beliefs about things, like when you're relaxing in the day room at night, do you want to listen to the newscaster berating you, or do you want some peace and quiet? Now, that's a conversation that leads to a conclusion that's your choice. But I bring, you know, I try and seed the conversation with all these things. What does it mean to go to sleep in a bunk room? Is there a chair in there at a desk? Or is this a monastic cell where, in time, the person walks in there and says, at this deep level, I'm here to sleep. And they put their head on the pillow and they go to sleep. Not hang around catching up on their you know, YouTube stuff or whatever. So, so that process will be there. And at the end of the process, whatever this committee is on your side of the table will be able to either say that's what we all do they'll say you know we couldn't agree about this thing we came to it we decided to um everything will come down to a rational choice made that is not bob's choice or schwartz silver's choice but your choice it's your building and people are going to live in it you know by the way, I don't believe in this 50-year thing. This is a permanent building. In Southbridge, they're moving out of a building built in 1892 because the doors don't fit. They were very careful when they designed it. There's a basement under it. They're still carrying modern equipment on that concrete slab that they built in 1892. We can do this thing so that your grandchildren aren't going to be stuck with the bill to replace it. Thank you. You bet. Have you, have you conducted post-occupancy evaluations of fire stations or other public yeah. safety buildings? Um, I did. Yeah. yeah. So what, what would be some lessons learned for, you know, from those evaluations? Well, I remember my favorite one was when we still had hose reels with a crank. The chief made me grab the crank and go like that so I could skin my knuckles, too. <laughs> so we learned things through these. Um, what, I'll tell you, okay. So there's this thing about, there's always an advocate for the day room and there's an advocate for the gym, and there's an advocate for this. There's never an advocate for the storage room. And when people start cutting corners, that's what they cut. And I have a series of pictures I can show you. Uh, I'm not going to name the building, but it's a very expensive new fire station where that got cut. And the place looks like a junk heap. And it's hazardous. You know, people trip and fall on an apparatus bay. I had a client where there had been a fatality from a trip and fall. We say there's nothing on the floor but tires and feet. To do that, you have to have storage rooms that are reflective of an actual inventory of what you got, your best guess about what's coming, and then some. Because the building that was done in whatever before the first Jaws of Life thing was bought, they never knew they were going to have to have a space for that. So we want to catch all that stuff. So what do I learn? I ask them all the time, what, what could we have done differently? They love the buildings. They must be something. Well, we could have used more storage space. 
it's, it's like the old joke about the spaghetti sauce. There's never too much. And, and other than that, we always have conversations about the distance from the pillow to the steering wheel and the kind of pathway it is. We spend a lot of time thinking about the ergonomics of that pathway. Let's say it's a staircase. How do you light it? How do you color the treads? How do you color the landing? Do you provide something they can hook their elbow around if they're going around a bend? What is the transition from the time you wake up in red light to the time you end up on the apparatus bay with a bright enough light level that whatever high acuity tasks you need to do, you can do? How do you do that in a way that doesn't put you in that spot where you can't tell what you're doing and you have a risk of tripping? Um, What's we, more dangerous, a pole or a <clears throat> stair? That whole conversation. And 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 we make a point of visiting the stations one year after, on the one year anniversary, to walk through it with the chief, so that we can actually understand what worked and what didn't work. And I'll tell you, the thing that is most that stands out most is a lot of a lot of comments we get back is. We never really understood this, um, the size of this or that. And so we've started really making an effort to do every, because plans, as an architect, I'm used to looking at plans. But as firefighters, yeah. you, you, you know, you're used to looking at a plan of a building to, to determine kind of where you need to go, but not spatially, it's thinking spatially. And some of- We show all the equipment. And when we put the equipment on, we have lines there that don't print that show us the manufacturer's requirements to do maintenance. Yeah. I visited a station up uh, in Andover. They had the, the washer extractor jammed in next to the drying cabinet. And you could not, when that motor goes on that washer extractor, you're going to have to do demolition to fix it. Yeah, and you know the other, the, it's an interest that that's kind of also interesting is the size of this equipment to be coordinated in a in a drawing set where we have ducts and beams and everything else, and so Revit has it, it, Revit is a three dimensional building program you probably are all familiar with, but it's come a long way and people are more familiar and it, the ease of use is become gotten to a point where we can actually make sure that that equipment isn't getting, it, the, the duct work over that equipment doesn't have to like bend up and over or flatten out to get over it because we'll have looked at it three-dimensionally. And so some of the three-dimensional modeling that is available to us now and wasn't available to, to, to some of the older people in the room like, right, right. like us. I use dinosaur cam. <laughs> um, has, is really, uh, has, you know, has its real advantages. Okay, last, last question. Uh, if you could, I know you've, you've uh, given us the, the team members that you presented. If you could just confirm who's taking the lead and also confirm that that team is gonna uh, be with uh, the project from design through construction administration to close out. Same, same people start to finish. Uh, absolutely. Um, the team is exactly the way we, we put it on the screen. I'll be the principal in charge. Sort Marshall will be the day-to-day -day contact. He will be the person that is um, in full communication. During the early parts of this project where we're programming firematic design, Bob Mitchell and Stort and maybe Kelsey or I or both of us will be on Zoom calls most likely and we'll be going through the, that entire process as a team because it's really valuable to hear the chief's input to hear the firefighters input on all of what they want. So when Bob is done programming and we're putting a plan together, we understand what the priorities were during that process. So our team is not gonna change throughout this. We, that it won't, we, we will be the set team throughout this whole thing. And Bob will be involved from beginning to end. Yeah. Bob has an associate, Ken Gale, um, 20 plus years of CA experience. Ken will be coming to the site during those intervals to inspect things like what Bob mentioned earlier, yeah. equipment. We, and we call Ken the enforcer. I, we're kind. We're a little kinder and gentler than yeah. than that. But <laughs> He's from we we understand it needs to be a good working relationship with the contractor. Okay, and a follow up to, to that is how quickly are you ready to commit your team to start? Um, 
tomorrow, tonight. You want to hire us tonight? We're ready. That, 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 that was an easy question, so. Okay, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, we haven't talked at all about net zero energy. Is this a priority of yours? Is this a goal of yours? And if so, do you want to ask any, us any questions about that? Uh, so we've talked about it a little bit. Um, I, I think we want to make it a conversation with the, the design team when we get there. Okay. Um, but we're happy as, to get involved as in as that As you guys have mentioned, we're a green community. We're certainly interested in in uh, being being sustainably responsible uh, as long as we can afford. You know, what what level of responsibility right. can we afford? Right. So we, right. we imagine I, that I, that will be the topic of conversation going forward. In 1974, I founded a firm called Solar Systems Design. I, you know, this is second nature stuff to me, and um, I'd be very interested. And most of it doesn't happen because of the cost part. But we will be able to explore what's plausible, what has the best long-term impact, what systems you can make a compromise in the short term because in the life of the building you'll be able to replace them. You know, when we go to an electric economy, no use having something if they don't have, to have enough power lines to support and all that. So we'd be happy to be involved with that. I'm pretty excited and to see the Chief's first electric fire truck. So. <laughs> <laughs> and there, like you said, there are definitely things that are easier, easier to achieve than others. Right? I mean, an all-electric building is, is a is something that we should be shooting for. Get off fossil fuels. You know that is something we should absolutely be shooting for. I think. All well, then, you know, to to the question that I asked, you know, we're going to have to explain to the community why there's value in investing in that. In that. Yeah, and sure. and some of those are easy to explain because they're actually more efficient and as a kind of life cycle cost, they're less. So those things are those are the types of things that are easy to explain. There are other, you know, if you said we're going to do, you know, geothermal wells, that would might be one to kind of justify because they're very expensive and you might not be able to justify that. But there are some that you will be easy to justify. You know, Kelsey's project right now is is a is a net zero. You can, um, yeah, that actually wasn't. I think kind of similarly the idea was that they wanted a fossil fuel free building if that was something that was financially feasible. It's the um, new public library in Medford. It's due to be completed with construction next month. Um, but for that building, we started with the PV as an ad alternate from the bid, and when it, it came in low, we were able to add it on, and that turned it into what's going to be the first net zero library in Massachusetts. Um, and it actually, when our MEP consultants for that did their kind of cost analysis life cycle study um, at the beginning of design about which system we were going to go with, it actually wound up being that the all electric system was had a lower upfront cost in addition to a lower lifespan cost. Um, so it kind of became a no brainer in that situation. Not to say that that's always the case, but I think as the technology improves, things get more kind of cost effective um, and that and could be the case. If we design our forever building, you know, the life yeah. cycle <laughs> works out pretty easy, right? So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Do, we have, do we have time to elaborate on one point on that? Or are we up against it? You're, we're, we're way over. Uh, <laughs> but, but ask the question. Oh, seriously, they're, they're here. We're so, here. So maybe, <laughs> we're over. maybe it'll be a quick one. What, what do you think about like the building's thermal performance, the envelope, investing in that you bet. You know, when we when you look at the life cycle. Yeah, because it, we. So I'll tell you in our in our day to day work, our standard wall in the administrative area is an R32, and it it, it it's going to sound weird when I describe it. It's a two by eight stud, because you don't get thermal bridging. I think that the whole industry lies through its teeth about the performance of steel studs and the masonry anchors that are penetrating through the foam on the outside into the steel. I think is a 30 to 40 percent reduction in the R value of the wall system that they don't acknowledge. So we've gone to this, and we this is what we're doing. And you know we need a robust vertical member because we have to have an L over 600 resistance for deflection in order for the masonry on a 14 foot high section. So it, you know the two by eight you can easily justify from the structural reason alone. Uh, 
the double wythe walls in the apparatus bay, we're putting three to four inches of Thermax on the outside of the interior wythe, and we're getting an R26 out of that. Now, do we want to go higher than those? We could. We haven't thought that it was cost justifiable. You know the. You know the. Uh, so the cost per additional R goes up once you get past a certain point, which is a function of constructability, and the energy saving going from 32 to 34 is a very small number for which you may pay a lot of money to get the extra insulation. So this is a wall system that, and, and I told you back in the 70s, I, we did thermal network modeling back when you did it on an SR52 handheld device, and, and I was teamed with people at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories doing this stuff under uh, funding from DOE back then. I think this is an optimal wall and we can provide that. Uh, and there are many places to find efficiency in the building. Uh, the roof being the cheapest one, but all the mechanical systems, the, the variable frequency motors, the, the high, well, we're not getting combustion devices, but all of those things that can be done, the controls, heat recovery, ventilation, there are a lot of places, but I've got to tell you, you can't get it down anywhere near zero. So you've got to have some pretty good area for a PV array if you think that on site you're getting down to net zero. Because the, the ASHRAE required ventilation rates in these buildings are pretty high. And even if you get 75% recovery on your heat recovery ventilator, and we use an enthalpy recovery because we're throwing out polluted air. It has to be a complete plastic film between the outside air and the inside air. It's just straight heat recovery. You can't get above 75 percent, really. Maybe you can get to 80. You're still, with those ventilation rates, you've got a big energy bill that you have to try and offset. So we look for all the other places to try and Good thing we have cut the losses. Sites. Big that site, lots sense? of room for PV. <laughs> I think um, also if um, envelope commissioning is something that Absolutely. the town wants to pursue, we can, you know, if that commissioning agent comes on board early enough, we can incorporate them while we're doing our construction documents and make sure that our details reflect what they think is kind of the most efficient way to, to build these things. Right. You can't count on the contractor. It's like, what was her name in Streetcar Named Desire? I always count on the kindness of strangers. <laughs> you know, the, the, the contractor has to be watched because it's easy to hide this stuff. The little leak holes, all of that stuff. You know, why is the air coming out of that outlet over here? Nobody knows why. But those are things that taping, taping the outlets, yeah, all that stuff is important and stuff that we know to look for during CA. Um, in terms of the envelope, you know, there are easy things. Roofs are easy to do. Walls are oftentimes easy to do. But you lose, you lose a lot of, um, you know, heat and cold loss through windows and doors. And in a, in a fire station, um, you've got an apparatus bay that we know doors. You, the doors are, are, are leaky. You, they can't not be leaky. Um, some are less than others. Some have a little more insulation than others. Um, but there is a lot of loss through, through those openings. And so, you know, you can look to minimize those openings, but oftentimes minimizing openings means you don't have daylight in the fire station. So, yeah. but it's all a balance. And I think it's a great, it's a great comment. Yes, envelope. You know, to keep an environment sound inside, it's got to have a robust envelope, or whatever you put inside just goes outside, and vice versa. So it's something that we kind of, you know, we, our firm does museums. Um, we do we do collection storage places that have to maintain 70 degrees plus or minus one degree and 50 percent humidity plus or minus five degrees. These are places that count on the envelope to preserve those environments. And that's some of the knowledge that we can bring to this when we do those, those uh, the, you know, the envelope work design for the, the fire station. Thank you very much. Thank you. One last follow-up. Could we get a copy of this presentation in PDF? Yes. Send that to me just so that yeah, where there's absolutely. time between now and when we make a decision, we want to be able to have it to refer back to. Absolutely. Of course. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What are your thoughts on the bifold doors? Don't like them. You don't like them. You ready? You want them? Okay. Yeah, I can. I can. It'll take more than 20 seconds. <laughs> okay. okay, several things about them. 
instead of being ten thousand dollars, they're thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, that's right. The big argument is that they open so much faster. You know, the overhead doors take sixteen seconds to get all the way to the top. If you don't think to open it till you've got the engine started and your foot on the pedal and you're holding the wheel, then you got a problem because you're going to be impatient. If you if you have a you know a mushroom switch at the doorway where you walk into the bay, it's open before you've even gotten to the truck. You can put a red and green light. So I think the whole speed thing is a red herring. The the construction of the doors, they're they're made out of uh, steel channels, so there's no R value. They pretend there's an R value. If you have a recessed panel, they got some insulation in there. That insulation is not even an inch thick, in order to get the look in the door where you've got the, you know, the framing and the set-in panels, and then, then you know they they claim that it pays for itself because you don't have repair bills. So it really irritated me when I read that. So I surveyed 20 of my former clients and found out that they average $100 per door per year in maintenance. You're not going to pay the extra $20,000 worth of door at $100 a year in, in reduced maintenance. And then the worst thing, there was a, uh, a ribbon cutting opening in, I think it was Tucson, somewhere down there, and somebody closed one of those doors and it killed, it crushed and killed a three-year-old. They're supposed to have sensors on those doors to but prevent not, that from happening. These are not doors that come down. They don't have the ability to have that kind of sensor. No, they do. Well, these are um, bifolding doors. I know. In Newton, we used the bifolding doors. I know, and I argued with them all about it. Well, but it was <laughs> it just, it, the door protrudes three feet into the room. That, now you're giving that up floor a very, space. That's that a very sells. relevant. Nobody fact. talks about the cost of that floor space at five hundred dollars a square foot. You know, we want to keep a certain clearance in front of the truck so you can run through. It's not so easy to run if you're serpentining around through. I have a lot of opinions about this stuff. I don't know. <laughs> you're going to have to buy me a beer so, or something. <laughs> a lot of beers. <laughs> That's right. It's a long night. <laughs> See, I think of myself as like the guys who are standing around the carburetor and the 57 Chevy in the garage talking about the needle valve. That's what we're doing. And, uh, <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this your flash drive, John? Um, no. No, that flash drive was here. I don't know if that was from the previous. Oh, that's mine. No, oh, that's yours. No. Who's the kid who got into that small? Yeah. <laughs> More? <laughs> I probably got cut sheets for bifold doors on that thing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. We really, um, this is the kind of project our firm loves to do. We love working with towns like you all um, and, and kind of designing buildings that will work for your town for, for years to come. So thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Okay, ready for the third group? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's one marathon night. Um, I guess uh, I'm assuming we'll kind of discuss everybody at the end. Like sure. We did. We did last time. Okay. Um, Vlad and I talked briefly. I think the thought, the best result at the end is to take have taken enough notes and refresh your memory when we're coming into next Thursday. So that if I handed out to you a sheet that said rank them one through five. That's the final product in this, and mm -hmm. these become your backup to how you justify that. Yep. So, everyone's going to be approaching this from a slightly different opinion. What's most important to you, and you know, and what you do for a living, and what you know, that sort of thing. And but rather than having some sort of score that we're driving to, you're all going to look at this in kind of your own way of who's best. And you know, I think it's probably the best way to come up with who you, who, the, who the top choice is. Keep it simple. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think you mentioned you can you can clean this I'm up. Clean I mean, we'll up. keep these obviously yeah, we'll we'll put for it the in first the two. We'll just keep combine it like this. Combine the ones going to be combined. Put it in the order yeah. um, that we had tonight, and, uh, and I'll have those for you on on Monday. Okay. Yeah, just hang on to them at the end. We'll just turn everything in. Okay. All right. Uh, no minutes to approve. Uh, no, we'll do them maybe yep. on the 16th when we have a lighter lighter agenda. Sure. We've okay. Interviewed <laughs> and then decided. Okay. I think that's the last agenda item. Then, so. I'll ask for a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. 
Second. Second. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Enjoy the exciting um, evening.